So to start out this story, I was best friends with a girl named Charlie for three years. I loved her, and I thought she loved me, but that wasn't true. Back in fifth grade, I had just been transferred to a new school. The whole class knew each other from the year before, and I was a complete outcast. I met Charlie at the school's open house, and apparently, we sat at the same table. She was really nice and bubbly, and she said she'd like to get to know me. I wanted a friend, and she was there. Sparing the details of awkward preteens trying to get through school, we became fast friends. We got each other Skype and we talked day and night. We called nearly every day and would just talk to ours. She made me laugh and we could talk about anything. And I also became friends with Charlie's friends Catherine and Addison. And we were a group of kids and had fun. But things changed subtly over time. Charlie became more depressed, mentioning that she'd been diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. I did my best to comfort her. What are friends for, right? And I assured her a diagnosis didn't change anything, and that it's a good thing that she's getting help for the issues. She agreed, but I don't think she really believed it. I'm not entirely sure when it started, but Charlie started venting to me about her emotions. I always listened and tried to help when I could find the words. I was her shoulder to cry on, and I was happy that I could help her in some way. It felt like repaying her for picking up the new nobody who wandered into her friend group. She never got better, though. She started to get more extreme and more serious breakdowns. She would call herself worthless, claiming that she could tell her parents hated her. I'd met her parents by that point, and they were loving people. They clearly cared about her, and I told her so. She called me a liar, saying that I should leave her to self-destruct and I should stop pretending that I care. I was heartbroken and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The next day at school, she seemed to be doing better, smiling and joking with our friends, and I tried to ask her about the night before. But she got a very serious look on her face and sounded angry, telling me that it doesn't matter anymore. I didn't pry, figuring she would talk about it later. That night, I asked her again, but I got a similar answer from before. I was confused, but I just went with it, and I wish that I hadn't. It went for months like that, her breaking down, spiraling, calling me a liar, a cheat, and saying that I hated her guts. Every attempt to comfort her or deny the accusations were met with, You liar! It became a routine. Charlie broke the routine by adding something new. She started to openly hurt herself in school. When she messed up, answered a question wrong, or sometimes for no reason, she'd take a mechanical pencil and start scratching her arm, holding it just to show me and her friends exactly what she was doing. Whenever we try to stop her, she'd snap at us, saying to stop pretending that we care and to... Shut up! Or, don't touch me! We didn't know what to do. We were just kids. The summer after fifth grade went pretty well. She seemed to be getting a bit better, with less spiraling and breakdowns. And we talked every day, and before we knew it, summer was over. Sixth grade, middle school. We were a year older and in a new school, we were still in a group, me, Charlie, Catherine, and Addison. This is when Charlie got worse again. She started having breakdowns during school and openly self-harming more. I was constantly worried for her. I don't think there was a full day that whole year that I could relax and not worry about her hurting herself. If memory serves, 
It was the first year she messaged me saying that she wanted to kill herself. She explained how she would do it and how easy it would be and how no one would care when she was gone. I was crying, hysterically trying to calm her down and saying how much I cared about her and how I didn't know what I'd do without her. She ended a conversation saying that she wouldn't do it. I was beyond relieved and made sure to check up with her the next day at school. She insisted that it wasn't that bad and that I had overreacted. I still insisted she be honest about those feelings and tell an adult if she was really thinking about suicide, and Charlie promised that she would. The rest of the year remained pretty consistent, with a steady incline in severity of her breakdowns, but slow enough that I hardly noticed the change. 7th Grade Middle School This was the year shit really hit the fan. This year is very fuzzy in my memory, so I'll have to just hit the main points. Charlie was starting to struggle in school. When she was immediately great at something, she gave up. She just stopped trying. The open self-harm got worse, going as far as to shout at me if I try to stop her. But she was still my best friend, and I loved her, and she loved me, right? We could talk to each other about anything, except when I tried to vent to her, she'd say that I was making it all about me or that she couldn't handle it right then. If she was having trouble and I tried to relate to her issues and give advice, she'd say that I was making it about myself and that I'm not her parent. This year, I started to really question my gender. I met my actual best friend and my now platonic partner, Liz. We were two broken trans kids, so deep in the closet that we couldn't admit that we were trans. Liz was the first to come out and I welcomed her with open arms, gushing about how much stuff we could do together. Charlie didn't like Liz. She was clearly jealous and thought Liz was taking me from her. I reassured her that I still cared about her and that she was still my number one, but she didn't believe me. About the middle of the school year, Charlie said that she might have a crush on me, and she asked if I would be opposed to being her romantic partner. At that time, I was very in denial about my sexuality, and I said that I wouldn't mind it. She seemed to take this as me consenting to some kind of relationship. She became more touchy, hugging me and even kissed my head or forehead a few times. I didn't know why at that time, but these actions made me incredibly uncomfortable and I wanted to shrivel up and hide. I now know it's because I'm touch-averse, but at that time... I hated myself for these reactions. I beat myself up inside for recoiling from my best friend and how dare I get grossed out. I very quickly fessed up to the discomfort, telling her that I didn't actually want to date her and that we weren't together and that I wasn't comfortable with the amount of physical contact she was giving. She seemed understanding, apologizing for being touchy, and even joking a bit about being touch-starved. After that, she started to get really distant when we were in person, and not just physical distance. She seemed to avoid talking to me for long and made any excuse to shut me up. The nightly routine of breakdown Russian roulette, or whether it be a couple sentences or four hours, continued. Warning. This section forward talks about suicide threats, so please listen with care. There were a few different times she threatened suicide. More than once, she'd say it would be my fault. And one particularly standout night, she sent me a video. There was Charlie, sitting in her bathroom next to the toilet. 
This is a paraphrase of what she said. It would be easy for me to just end it. I could drown myself in the toilet and no one would know. It would be quiet and no one would care. My parents don't give a shit. I texted her over and over again, begging for her not to do anything, saying that I loved her and her parents loved her and that I would miss her. I cried so much that I got dehydrated, and I stayed up past midnight just waiting for her to respond, but she didn't, and I thought she was dead. I thought she had killed herself and it was my fault, and that I should have gotten to her sooner. And I cried myself to sleep that night. When I got to school, I saw her walking into class and my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. I ran up and hugged her, and I wept and begged her for an answer, asking where she had been, saying that I thought she died. She chuckled. <laughs> Jeez, I'm sorry, I forgot to check my phone last night. It felt like everything stopped. I just stared at her. This person, who I'd loved for years now, who I looked after, talked to, cared for, and couldn't live without, just laughed about it? I didn't know what to say. I was so dumbfounded that I just tried to act normal. And my whole view of her shattered that day, and it was the beginning of the end. That year droned on, and I slowly started to push away from Charlie. I still cared deeply for her, but I couldn't take it anymore. Her breakdowns and her ramblings and venting was daily, and I just couldn't handle her berating me. I felt terrible, like I was abandoning her, and it felt like leaving a person with a broken foot to walk a thousand stairs themselves. But I had to get away. I started talking to our mutual friends about what she did and was doing, and they said that it was terrible and couldn't believe she would say such things. I showed them the conversations, feeling even more guilty for showing off our private text to other people. But I had to prove it though, and I had to make them believe me. In the end, I did get away from Charlie. I think my other friends did too, but they didn't do much for me. They shut me out, and while I was broken, healing from a three years long wound, they talked about me behind my back, added fuel to my fire, only to tell me that I only ever talked about Charlie. I lost pretty much all of my friends that year, and I tried to resettle back into my group of friends at first. But it wasn't the same as before. I was constantly worried that they were talking about me behind my back, and I was terrified that they saw me to be on the same level as Charlie. So I left that group. It was for the best in the end. It's been a few years now, and I can say with certainty that I have trauma from those years of abuse. And this post is by no means detailed enough to capture the horrific experience that was my time as Charlie's friend. But I don't want to reopen old wounds. I am still great friends with Liz, and she has honestly saved me from Charlie's reign of terror. Her kindness and friendship, contrasted with Charlie's everything, woke me up to how awful it was. I don't hate Charlie despite all of the things that she did to me. She was a terrible person and an absolute monster of a human. But we were just kids. I know that I'm not the same person that I was back then, and I figure that she isn't either. Everyone deserves a second chance in life. But Charlie, let's never meet again. Additional Information I wanted to add some clarity and specify some of Charlie's actions. I try to paint broad strokes, but it seems that some things need to be clarified. So let's begin. Charlie was on antidepressants starting in the summer post fifth grade. She often blamed her outburst on her unfit medication or stating, 
Oh, I forgot to take my meds. I later found out that she had been lying. Her parents ensured that she took her medication at the right time each night, and her forgetting it was a complete lie used to excuse her actions. Later in the timeline of abuse, 7th grade, she would say things like, Don't even try, she'll be back soon. Referring to herself during a mental spiral or breakdown as a different person. This is also when she started to claim to not remember doing the things she did during breakdowns. I know for a fact that she was lying about this because in private, she would admit to remembering and say how she's not really two different people. Every time it was just used as excuses for her to be a horrible person. More often than not, she told me it would be my fault if she killed herself. If I left her, whatever she did to herself afterwards would be my fault. And if I stopped being her friend, it would prove her right. So I stayed. Those few nights that she stopped talking abruptly, I was horrified that she died and it would be all my fault. I thought her parents would get mad at me, screaming and crying at me for killing their daughter. But that day never came. I got out and I escaped her iron grip and I have never been more thankful for having true friends who love me. I truly don't know where I'd be now if I had stayed. During 8th grade, she was still in my school. We had the same math class each morning, and I did everything possible to ignore her. Sometimes, I would see her in the hall or at lunch, and I couldn't bring myself to look at her. At one point, we were outside on break and she was right next to me, but I couldn't look at her face. It felt like if I were to look, my eyes would burn like looking directly at the sun. It would be easy to hate her for everything she did to me and others. But hatred only breeds contempt. I do hope she has found a better life. But I dearly hope, for my sake, that we never meet again. I've been needing to express myself about what happened between October 2017 to February 2019. So, here's some backstory to try to answer some questions before they get asked. I graduated from school in 2016 and I wasn't working at this time. It wasn't like that I didn't try to find work, I did. I just didn't get many calls back, and I had a couple of job interviews, but they all fell flat. And it didn't help that I stupidly refused to put my resume forward to the local supermarkets because most of the high school bullies work at which, and the thought of working with a group of people who terrorized me for four-ish years filled me with too much anxiety. So instead, I spent most of the time surrounded with a select few friends that I had, which in the end wasn't that many at all. I spent most of the time developing our relationship further, instead of finding friends, a mistake that I would come to regret when we split right before high school ended. I didn't really have many friends to fall back on, and I had only one really close friend all throughout high school that we will call Sam, as I don't want to use any real names. Sam was really supportive when me and my girlfriend broke up. He also had a great job and a really nice family, money, friends, and at that time was a pretty good influence on me, as my parents would say. He didn't do any drugs or drink, and I looked up to him as a person and as my best friend. So, it was a really easy decision when Sam asked me to move in with him when we found a cheap rental property. Sam's family were friends with a small real estate agent office, 
so it was easy for Sam to find a house. Even if it was stupidly priced for the condition of the house, we were stupid and our parents just wanted us out. Sam's family believed that he was too successful for them to need to support and my parents, or stepdad, wanted me out because he was tired of needing to support me. Again, I wasn't working. Sam and I moved out with his childhood friend, who we will call Blake. Now, before we moved, I had never met this person before and he was never really home because he was always out for work or dirt bike riding. He lived with us for about four months before the first big terrible event happened. Sam let two strangers, from Blake's perspective, sleep in his bed when he was away from home. Blake got home one night at 2.30 a.m. ready for bed to walk into his room and to see two teenagers having sex in his bed. He left the next day, and as far as I know to this day, after their last argument, they never talked to each other again. So, after that brief intro, this is where I will get into the bulk of this post, starting from February of 2018. At this point, I had a source of income. I had gotten a job through my dad, and I was enjoying being out of the house. And by this time, I was starting to suspect that something was wrong with Sam. He wasn't leaving to go to work before me, which was weird. He was increasingly snappy and angry all the time, and he was leaving work early all the time and didn't tell me where he was going. In the end, he was cheating on his girlfriend at that time with a girl from our high school. The first few months with my friend acting this way, he would threaten to move all my stuff out of the house and onto the road if I didn't do something he said, like cleaning up the house on my own, or going shopping, or any other various task. I didn't have much, only my mattress. He accidentally broke my bed frame while I was at work, and my office computer too, which I used for Discord and playing small indie games, so it wouldn't be hard for him to actually do it. He never did, but, but I guess it was because that I never really argued with him. He started stealing my clothes, which didn't even fit him, and he would let me borrow his shirts to brag about how good of a friend he was. Eventually, he just stopped cooking food for himself. Sam's dad had given him a fuel card to use for petrol. He used to buy fast food twice a day for months, until his dad cut him off from the card, in which he turned to two-liter bottle of iced coffee and McDonald's nightly. I understand that this was more of his business and not mine, but he eventually asked me to cover his part of the rent, and he couldn't afford bills, which made it my issue. He asked me to buy him food, and when I refused, he would guilt trip me into feeling like absolute shit, or he would block the entrance to the house or my doorway to my room. I was already really anxious since he had started getting more aggressive and angry, so I often agreed, which left me struggling with money. At some stage, he just stopped going to work, and as he explained it, Oh, uh, work let me leave early today, and they said that they would call me in again if they needed me. We got into an argument and I told him that he was wrong, that he still had to go to work. It took him ten weeks to call up his work, who explained to him they meant for that day, and that they had registered him as abandoning his job, so he ended up unemployed. I tried to support him as much as he had for me during my breakup and when I moved in when I was unemployed, but he got really mad and angry all the time, which he took out on me, screaming at me for being right. 
because of all his free time, he started inviting the girl from high school over all the time, threatening me to keep it as a secret from his girlfriend. Obviously in the end I didn't, since I was close with Sam's current girlfriend. I was actively trying to stay out of the house, so I only ever saw this girl over two or three times. But in reality, she was over all the time when I was at work, about four times a day. For the more tragic part of when I was living with him, he decided to buy some pets. He was given a bird from his family, he brought a dog, which he called Sparta, and he decided to buy a cat, which he called Skittles for the girl from high school, which unfortunately ran away. He then brought another cat and called it Skittles again. And the state that this kitten was left in was appalling when either the girl or I wasn't around the house. It was revealed that he would lock the kitten in a closet and only feed her when he remembered. I should have tried harder to protect the animals in the house and I tried my best to feed them when Sam wasn't around. But when he caught food missing, he would question me. When he found me feeding his cat, he grabbed me, slammed me into the wall and screamed at me for poisoning his animals. And I remembered he hit me, like really hard. One day, I came home and the bird that he kept near the door wasn't there and Sam wasn't home. I asked him where the bird was and apparently... It had fallen over in its cage and broke its neck. This was where immediate panic started and I realized that I was living with someone who was much more than depressed. Sam came home later and I was ready to explode at him as I was fueled with rage and anger for what he has done to the bird and with an empty shoebox he proceeded to go to our backyard. I followed him, and it turns out that he had the box to bury the kitten, who, according to Sam, broke its neck jumping around the closet. I remember the way he told me vividly. He wasn't sad or angry. He was empty. His eyes felt hollow, and he told me that he wasn't sad about it, and he went back inside to his room and locked himself in there and I didn't see him for nearly a week. I came home one day from a very tiring day from work, and I had requested to get the morning off to clean for a house inspection. At this point, I believe that this was our second one, so I stayed behind at work to do some overtime. Sam thought that I was out for the night, and when I got home around 8.30, I found him and the girl from high school, smoking weed in our lounge room. I didn't say a word. I couldn't. And at this point, Sam wasn't the person that I went to high school with. Every day for over the past six months, he had found a way to yell, steal, guilt, punch and kick, and threaten me nearly every day. There was always a reason he ate at me blamed me for what happened to the bird or cat because I wasn't there to stop them from hurting themselves. This was one of the final turning points for me. I went to bed and had a sleepless night, and I heard Sam insult me and heard him cheat on his girlfriend. I heard him lie about money, being employed, and using everything he remembered from high school to impress her. The next day, I told his girlfriend, and I stole his dog who was incredibly malnourished, even after that I had been sneakily feeding him a handful of dry food twice a day. And that dog was also beaten. I called the RSPCA and reported him for animal abuse, and I emailed photos that I took of the house for proof. I used the cover of the real estate agent coming over for an inspection to protect myself from him overreacting. When I came back to collect the last of my things, which was my old PC, I stupidly entered the house, thinking that our real estate agent was in there. 
I thought his car was there when it wasn't, and I was greeted in the hallway by a shirtless Sam who pushed me against the wall. He smelt of weed and alcohol. The smell of weed and alcohol was burning into my skin. He pushed me against the wall with one hand and showed me a knife in the other hand. He had pinned me against the wall with a knife in his hand. There was a long argument, which was him more screaming at me and me shaking and not being able to spit my words out. He got angry when I told him where Sparta was and ran the silver of the knife down my arm. I remember feeling like I blacked out and everything was a blur. He kept getting more and more intense, going on about how I betrayed him as a friend and his girlfriend dumped me over him. He let go of my neck and pushed me harder into the wall with his shoulder and drew the knife close to my neck and I truly felt like I was going to die, and I muttered out, <coughs> My friends can hear you. We were close enough to my room, and he often knows that when I left my room, I always had Discord open. He let go of me, and I ran away to my car and left. I stayed with my parents for a couple of days living on their couch, too afraid to really talk to anyone, and my parents called me jumpy, and I told them that I missed them because I hardly seen them over the past ten or so months. Sam chucked me a message saying that we need to talk, which we did in a public place. He told me that he was moving out back to his parents because he could no longer support himself and that the house had too many bad memories for him. And he laughed. To this day, I still have not seen him. This was around August of 2018. People from high school stopped being his friends once the girl and I told all of our collective friends what he did and how he acted, and I reported him to the police. I never pressed charges, but I told them that I never wanted to see Sam again. I don't think anything ever came out of it, and I couldn't afford to get a restraining order, as I recall being told that they cost money, but it is reported. I moved back into my house on my own, and he left all of his furniture and bedding as it was, only taking his headphones, his PS4, and his TV. From that moment on, I was alone and living in the house that my best friend nearly killed me in. I was sleeping on his couch in the lounge room because I couldn't afford my own. I was alone and I was in a really bad headspace and I stopped talking to all my friends and at work and I started having nightmares. So this was dating from October of 2017 to August of 2018. I was still in the house until early 2019, which, living in the aftermath of what Sam did to me, was bad, if not worse, than living without him. The isolation and darkness, and the things that I saw and regret not doing, like not being there to save the bird and the cat, still eat away at me. I will need to do some digging, but I will try to find images of this house and the dog for proof if needed. Things didn't get better and then worse until I met a girl. So where am I now? At the end of 2019, I met my current partner. She's absolutely incredible and we actually brought a house together last month. We currently live with my parents until we move in in two weeks, and I think of all my negative feelings about my old house and Sam have resurfaced due to me moving again. In the end, I'm still cared and cautious, but getting this off my chest is a way that I am moving forward and putting my old house behind me. This happened to me last night. 
Basically, I went to an elementary school in my neighborhood at around 9 p.m. at night. It was a Saturday, so there was no one there. I went there and pulled out my skateboard since I wanted to practice, and it was rainy during the afternoon, so this might have been my only chance to get some practice in. My mom was in the car, taking some short clips of my skating. So, I'm just skating around and pulling out some tricks when I hear, Hello! In the creepiest high-pitched voice, it sounded like one of those dolls where if you press the tummy, a sound would come out. At first, I thought maybe someone was walking by and talking, but the sidewalk was really far away and that voice sounded way too close. I looked around the empty parking lot and it's just my mom who's still in the car. And I hear, Hello! Hello! Again and again and it sounds too close for comfort and I am genuinely freaked out then. I just happen to glance at the roof and I see this guy wearing a fucking face mask like the ones you buy for Halloween. He's waving and has something heavy in his hand, like a brick or a rock, and he's saying hello in that high-pitched creepy-ass voice again. I notice the brick or rock, so I grab my skateboard and run back to the car. I wasn't fucking staying there. and My mom even got a clip of me running the fuck out of there. Anyway, my mom was really confused as I drove back, but she told me to turn around so she could see what was going on. So I go back, and she rolls down the window. And all we can hear is screeching, like someone is bursting out their lungs. It was scary as shit, so we drove back home. It was probably some teenager fucking with us, but that guy was holding a brick or something. And I would rather not get on this guy's bad side. My brother and I worked across the street from a mini storage place, and roughly two years ago, we noticed they had an auction sign out front. We decided to check it out, so we walked over hoping to find something interesting. If you haven't watched Storage Wars, the way these work is the auctioneer opens a unit and you are not allowed to enter or touch anything, and you only have a window of about 15 seconds to look around and decide if you want to bid. This unit was small, 4 feet by 4 feet, and my brother and I noticed a group of 5 fishing poles amongst other boxes and bags. We've been talking about buying a few poles, and this seems like a good chance. So we yelled out a low bid and won. Per the auction rules, we had until end of day to empty out the unit. Being small, this was a two garbage can job, so we got a can and started sorting. It started out promising, with finding a nice microscope and a few tools, etc. Standard storage stuff. I pulled out a plastic garbage bag and opened it to find... Another tied shut garbage bag which I opened to find another tied shut garbage bag. And since nothing terrifying is ever kept in triple tied bags, I opened it to find the dried mummified remains of a very old and very dry cat. My brother and I just stopped and stared at each other. And since neither of us needed a dried out cat at the moment, we weren't sure how to handle this specific piece of storage unit treasure. We did what we always do when faced with something this out of context. We just laughed uncomfortably. Until we looked back into the unit and noticed two more tied garbage bags. At the end of the day, we found three bags with parts of or entire cats. We also aren't doctors, but we are pretty sure there are at least some dog parts in there as well. Granted, saying it was a storage unit full of dead cats would be a bit of an exaggeration. But, considering that a storage unit generally has no dead cats, I think a small unit with three or four could be considered full. 
As if multiple bags of dead cats wasn't bad enough, the creepiest part of the whole thing was finding his or her creepy drawings of cats and a used pink cat food and water bowl. I spoke with the manager of the storage unit facility and explained my findings, and I asked who owned that unit. Obviously, they couldn't give the name, but when I asked if they were perhaps a vet, the owner laughed and said, definitely not. He also said that helps explain why the person's other abandoned unit that had gone up for auction prior had been full of empty plastic cat carriers. This happened about four weeks ago now, on a Saturday. I live near a coastal area that has a few popular beaches, and on this night, I was with two other friends. But it was really late, so there weren't really any other people around, except for the occasional police car, or other visitors to the beach. We must have gotten there close to 11pm, and we hung around, sitting in my car and on the beach wall for a few hours. The three of us were talking about some sad stuff that a friend had been going through, so we were already in an upset mindset. Nothing weird happened while we were there, and there were just some other kids that would hang around for a bit and leave. We left the beach at around 1.30am, and I'm driving, and I have a friend in the passenger seat and one in the seat directly behind me. The road back to town goes past a state park and goes down a rural back road with some houses along the way before you get to the main road. A white Subaru pulled out in front of us as we drove by the park a few minutes after that we left the beach. We didn't really think much of it until it started going really slow, like maybe 15 miles per hour when the speed limit was 25 or so in the area. We weren't concerned at first, but just annoyed. This continued for a bit, and because we were on this winding back road, I couldn't pass them. After a few minutes, the road curved to the right, and I noticed something running down the side of the road against traffic and towards my car. I was very confused at first that someone was running at almost 2 in the morning, I immediately noticed that this person was dressed in all black and had a huge mane of gray hair. I told my friends to look at this shit because my attention was fixed on not driving into this very slow car in front of us. I noticed out of the corner of my eye that as this guy continued down the road towards my car, he drifted further into the road. I thought he was avoiding something on the shoulder. But a second later, my friend scream, and I look to my left to see the guy right next to my door. At this point, I have a little bit of space between me and the car in front of us, so I floor it for a second to get past him. The car does not stop though, and we keep driving for a minute or so, until we reach this traffic circle where the car immediately goes back down the road we just left and much faster than it was driving before. My friends and I were freaking out because I didn't realize what was happening, but that it was very weird. And as we drove away, my friends told me that as he got closer, they could see the guy had his face all painted white, except for black circles around his eyes. He had this green clown wig on, and my friend in the passenger seat noticed that he was holding either a crowbar or a bat, and that the one seated behind me said that he was running right for my door, which was unlocked at that time because my car doesn't automatically lock, and that that person was reaching out for my door, only like a foot away by the time that we got away. We called the sheriff, and they looked, but didn't find anything, and neither did we. When we were out of adrenaline rush, we went back to see where it happened. What do you think this was? At first, we didn't connect the car with the clown guy, 
and initially thought that maybe he had just done something like rob a house in the neighborhood. You know, because of the clown getup and the bat or the crowbar, and that he was running away from it and was gonna carjack us to get away. But my friend's mom thinks that we may have been identified when we were at the beach as targets for some kind of robbery. My only thing is that if the car was involved and they wanted to do some harm to us, they could have done it like at a stop sign so that we couldn't have gotten away. If anyone has any ideas, please comment. It was really a distressing situation in the moment, especially considering how close a call it was. And we really just wanted to have some kind of idea about what we experienced that night. So this is my first post. What I'm going to say happened two years ago. I was only 10. Just so you know, my English isn't native, so feel free to correct me if I'm making any mistakes. Even my parents don't know about what happened, but hanging here and reading other people's stories made me feel the urge to share mine as well. For the context, we were in China, in a very luxurious hostel organized like that. We, as in my father, mother, little sis, and me. The entrance of the hostel is a building itself from which you had to take an elevator to access a big park. From this park, you had to walk three to four minutes to arrive in front of an approximately 30-floor building. It's designed to contain one really big suite per floor. So when taking the lift, you scan your card and it will automatically bring you to the floor associated with it. So the third day of our trip, my parents decided to go on a date together, leaving me and my sister alone in the suite. They left some cash so we could order some takeaway food. Chinese people love these. So I ordered some noodles and waited. When somebody finally called to say it was all good, I went to search the food. That's when I had my first big mistake. I didn't close the front door, thinking nobody could come here and I wouldn't be able to open it since I'd have a lot of things in my hands. So I called the lift and waited. Way too long. Then it was finally here. Somebody was in it. I politely said, Hello but he didn't answer. He was wearing red sweats and an Adidas jogger. I pushed the zero button and the man headed out. The door was closed when I finally realized my second big mistake. Why the hell did he go out? He shouldn't since there wasn't any other room except my family's. That's when I started to panic. I tried to stop the lift but it wouldn't stop, so as soon as I arrived to the ground floor, I immediately went back to my room floor. The front door was wide open, and the absence noise made me feel uncomfortable assuming that either my sister had been caught or she was hiding. I went for the second option because the man was taller than me. He was a meter 90, I was a meter 40, which meant that his footsteps must have sounded heavier than mine on the ground, and I believed in my sister's intelligence to figure that out. I finally found her hiding behind one of the sofas, crying. She told me that the man was searching in the luggage for valuable items. We played hide and seek with him for almost 30 minutes. The room was real big, and I finally went in my room and called the reception to call some security guys to arrest the man. Going in my room, I noticed my Nintendo Switch had vanished. Everything went pretty smoothly, and the man turned out to be the son of an inhabitant here, cruelly lacking of any money. Afterwards, it seemed logical because either way, how could you've come into the residence building? One creepy thing. He had a knife on him, coming from the kitchen of our suite, showing that he didn't just want some goods. So, creepy man in the hostel. Let's not meet. I just remember this encounter recently. Back in the summer of 2012, I was 22 at that time, and my friend and I had just left from a party across town, and we were parked in front of my apartment complex. 
It was about 3 in the morning and we were bullshitting and talking about the party and decided to smoke a little weed before heading into the apartment. I was in the passenger seat as I'd let my friend drive us home because he was less inebriated. Unfortunately, the car window on my side wasn't rolling down, so I opened the door to let out some smoke as I smoked a cigarette. This caused the car's inside lights to be on so my friend could load a bowl. We were parked next to the sidewalk and the gate to my apartment was directly next to us. I see a man walking about 15 feet up the sidewalk come into view. In my state, I have very little time to react and I'm still propping the passenger side door open as he passes by. He and I make eye contact momentarily as he can see the two of us due to the car's lights being on. And then I get a chill down my spine. He looks almost goblin-like. He's about 5 foot 10 and is wearing an oversized yellow hoodie and a gaunt face with hollowed out cheeks and leathery tan skin like he may be on something. His head and chin covered in patches of pubic looking scraggy black hair with blonde bleached highlights. He smiles to reveal what's left of some rotten yellow teeth. He seems to be walking quickly with purpose but stops suddenly by my door and asks, Is this my car? Then he yells with a raspy tone, You stole my car! He then grabbed my door, leaving one hand in his hoodie pocket, clearly holding something. Startled, I slam the door on his hand, and he screams trying to still hold on, so I slam it again, and he quickly pulls his hand away, and I lock the doors. He continues to shout into my window, spitting on it, and even pressing his face against it as he does. I turn to my friend, pale-faced and wide-eyed, fumbling to get the keys into the ignition, as the man begins circling to the front of the car, and then pulls out a bottle of what I assume is lighter fluid out of his pocket, and start spraying it all over the hood and windshield. I look back over at my friend and he still can't get the keys in the ignition. The man then pulls out a metal lighter and starts it as he laughs and scream. <laughs> this is my car! <laughs> in a moment of clarity, I manage to grab my friend's hand to guide the key into the ignition and say, Drive! He then slams on the gas and peels out into a U-turn, and the man barely backs up enough to not be pinned into the car in front of us as my shoulder gets thrown against the door due to the sudden burst of speed. As we drove down the street going about 65 on a 25, I look back with tears welling up in my eyes and vaguely see the man dancing around with his lighter in the middle of the street. We blow through red lights and stop signs and don't stop for about half a mile. When we stop, I call my roommate and he walks out with a concealed firearm and says that he can't see anyone. So we return and he escorts us back inside. It all happened in a split second and my friend remained quiet and pale-faced for about an hour after the incident and I made sure to park inside the apartment gates from then on. This happened about eight years ago when I lived in an apartment building in the downtown area of a mid-sized U.S. city. It was around 11 a.m. I would normally have already been up and about for hours, but on this day, I decided to sleep in for a while. If I had been awake, I likely would have had my door propped open for a few inches to allow air to circulate as the smell from the hallway could get stale and musty and linger inside my apartment. So, 
My cat and I were being lazy asses this day when we were both jolted awake by a very loud and abrupt rumble. I heard a man's loud, angry yell, and to me at that time, it sounded perhaps like noise from the construction site across the way. Maybe someone had slipped or dropped something heavy on their foot. It was all but a moment, but it was enough to encourage my cat and I to finally get up out of bed. I went about my morning, made myself some breakfast, and I had a fairly large set of windows that overlooked the street. At one point while I was cooking, I saw a series of police vehicles show up, which include what I'd call a paddy wagon and a detective vehicle. They were blocking the driveway to the parking lot, which was right beneath my window. So, I had a perfect view of everything that was going on. I remember the noise that I'd heard about an hour earlier, so I thought there must have been some kind of incident. It was downtown after all, so I wasn't exactly surprised. A small group of onlookers formed across the street, and I could tell that whatever they were looking at was well out of my view so I just continued to observe from my vantage point. At one point, I saw a man on a stretcher being wheeled into either the paddy wagon or an ambulance, I can't really recall. He had oxygen on his face, and he was shirtless, and his chest area was heavily bandaged. By then I figured there must have been a shooting in the garage below. Scary, but I still didn't think too much of it. After the police and the looky loos left, I went about my day. I went to take my trash out later, but a police officer was standing at the end of the hall by the trash chute. I went up to the third floor, but the same deal. So I went back to my apartment with my garbage still in hand. Later that evening, I tuned into the news hoping that I'd hear anything about what happened. My mother and my grandmother actually lived in the same building. I was the only one who'd heard the noise, but we were all interested in learning what went on. Finally, we see footage of our building along with an image of a bike that had been ditched and maybe a bloody shirt. According to the news report, a man with a warrant was spotted by police and took off on a bike. I've read different accounts that say that he stole the bike that he took off on. I've also read that the police weren't even after him, but he freaked out and ran when he saw them. I'd be apt to believe that bit, considering the warrant was for a misdemeanor. Unfortunately, there is less information on the story these days outside of one local source and a short clip on ABC News. Either way, the man ended up at my apartment building moments later. He ran inside the building, which makes the fact that I slept in that day and did not have my door open all the more serendipitous. And, in a last-ditch attempt to evade the police, he decided to jump down the trash chute. On the way down, he triggered the trash compactor and was crushed to death. That was the noise that I'd heard, the rumble, the man's yell, and the building shake. I heard a man die in the most awful way. The only thing I can say is that since I didn't know what it was that I was hearing at that time, it fucks with me less. My mind doesn't associate the two events, and it all happened so fast. My mom and my grandmother had their own input. They were down in the garage a little later than the incident occurred, and they had no knowledge of what went on. But my grandmother said that she saw the maintenance guy, a really nice dude from Central America, walking by and she said that he had a really intense look on his face. 
The news had said that the victim's body had been found by a building worker and there were only two guys and a housekeeper or two. And I'm sure that it must have been him that found the body. I moved out months later and it was more just time to move up in my living situation. But I will say that I had a difficult time taking out the trash for a while after that. A little bit of backstory. I had went to Miami earlier this month and didn't know a lot of people there, but I still went. I'm 20 and I'm not really jacked, but I know how to hold myself. I had got there on a Saturday and I knew that weekend nights at the beach are when the fun things happen. Night eventually rolled around and I took an Uber to South Beach. I walk around for about an hour and a half and find a bench to sit down at to check my phone. As I am sitting down, minding my own business, a person walks up to me and sits on the same bench as me. I didn't think much of it, the place was packed being that it was a weekend night. A few minutes passed by and he starts up a conversation with me. I will refer to him as dude. He seemed like a chill person, around the same age as me, average build. I'm usually really good at reading vibes, and I didn't get any negative vibes from him. I tell him that I'm new here, and that I had just arrived in Miami, and that I don't really know anyone here. That was probably my first mistake. My phone had started to die, and I also needed to use the restroom. But the bars and the restaurants there won't let you use their restroom unless you're a customer. So I was shit out of luck. The dude told me that he has a place not too far away from here and offered to let me come over to use the restroom and also to charge my stuff for a few minutes. Looking back now, I should have declined the offer, but I did take him up on the offer. We get to his place and as soon as I enter, I got really odd vibes. His house was just giving off negative energy, but I don't pay it any attention. He tells me where I can plug my stuff in and shows me the way to the bathroom. So, after using the bathroom, I walk back into the living room and sat down. My plan was to let my stuff charge for 15 to 20 minutes and then I would leave. The dude sits down beside me and we actually had a pretty good conversation at first. He just seemed like a chill person who was trying to be nice. But about 5 minutes after he sat down beside me, that's when things took a turn. He gets up, walks to the kitchen and pours two glasses of vodka. He walks back to me and hands me one. I didn't want to come off as rude, so I took the glass and just held it. I wasn't trying to get drunk, especially around someone that I just met. After he realized that I wasn't drinking, he kept on trying to get me to drink. He kept saying stuff like, Come on, I just want to help you relax some. I told him that I didn't want to drink, and he got visibly upset. He started saying stuff like, I let you in my house and you can't take a shot with me? At this point, my gut was telling me to get the fuck out of there, but I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure his intentions weren't as pure as I had originally thought. As I was trying to figure out a way to leave without upsetting him, he started to compliment my looks. And as someone who was sexually assaulted two years ago, my fight or flight response was kicking in. I got up and acted like I was looking for my wallet in my backpack. I acted like I couldn't find it and that I probably left it at the beach. I said that I was going to walk back to the beach and that I would return when I found my wallet. And no... I definitely didn't plan on returning. 
I packed my stuff, and as I was doing so, the dude started laughing. It was such a demonic laugh that I'll never be able to get it out of my head. I bolted out of the door, and I get on the sidewalk and start walking away. I'm not even off the block yet, and I hear his door open back up. The dude starts speed walking towards me as if he was following me while he was still laughing demonically. My first thought was, Okay, well, this is a serial killer and I'm about to be killed. I started to run. I don't know exactly how far I ran, but it was at least five blocks. Once I knew that he wasn't following me anymore... I spent my last $10 on an Uber to get me far away from the area. The night was still young, and I knew the nightlife would still be active at the beach. So, I went back to the beach just about 10 miles away from my original location, just to make sure that if he went back there looking for me, that he wouldn't find me. So, to the dude who was trying to push himself on me, Fuck you. A few years ago, I was dating a great man for whom I have a lot of respect. He's a good person, he's kind of the perfect man, and let's call him Noah. We broke up because I had to move to begin my training as a magistrate. It was really a peaceful breakup. We have a lot of affection for each other, and we're still very good friends. Our families are friends too, and it's kind of funny because he lives where my parents live. For my part, I live in the same neighborhood as Noah's parents. It's a friendly and caring relationship that we have now. Because of COVID-19, I can't go to see my parents for Christmas and New Year. So I spent the holidays with Noah's parents. Two weeks later in January, I leave my house to go to work. Someone wrote insults on my door, and my car is scratched, and my blood is freezing, and I'm pretty shocked. You should know that magistrates and friends are protected. Fines and prison sentences are even harsher when an offense is committed against them. I'm a little afraid that it's due to the case that I'm working on. I deal mainly with land stories, buildings, and damn it, there are people who are crazy sometimes. It is not a reasonable fear because I work on cases without dangerous people. I had to contact the cops, inform the court, and etc. And these kinds of stories are not taken lightly. The police quickly find out who the person behind it is, a certain Elsa. At that time in France, anyone leaving their home after 7 p.m. without permission was fined 135 euros. The day before, someone had been caught two kilometers away and fined. The police then ask me if I knew the person who did this, and she's a lady in her mid 60s her face is unknown to me, but I am not withdrawing my complaint. A week later, I get a call from Noah who warns me that he is visiting his parents with his girlfriend whom he's been dating for a year. We are both friends on social media and she's a normal person. At that time in France, to move between different regions, you had to have a good motive. I didn't ask him about it, and I told myself that he wanted to see his parents and that he found an excuse to come. I come home from work at night, and it does not miss. I surprise the crazy old lady of the photo near the entrance of my building. She clearly drank before I got there, and I'm on the defensive. I was ready to fight if it's unpleasant. She called me a whore that I was too involved in a guy's life and that I was trying to separate them. In short, that I was the other woman in her daughter's couple. I don't ask her any questions and I let her talk, stunned. 
Furious, I called the policeman, who tried to calm the old lady. I went up to my house with a few men because my presence made her angry. And later, I learned that she went to a van, but they didn't let her drive because she was drunk. It was only a few days later that I learned the truth. Noah visits me on weekends with his girlfriend. She told me that they came for her mother, who was declared demented. Apparently, she almost assaulted someone. Police found a shotgun in the back of her car. A little panicked, I asked her if her mother's name was Elsa. The police and doctors thought that she was just crazy and that she wanted to attack me for no reason. But Noah's girlfriend explained that it was because I had spent Christmas with her boyfriend's parents when she couldn't do it. Her mother had taken the news very badly and she was afraid that her daughter would lose her boyfriend. I'd rather laugh about it than cry. The mother is on treatment now and I withdrew my complaint. I think about this story now because I learned that Noah and his girlfriend are expecting a baby. Well, what a funny story. Some years ago, couch surfing was still a new thing, and I, a female, early 20s at that time, was a very active user on the platform. I stayed with many hosts as a traveler, but also frequently hosted couch surfers in the two little bedroom apartment that I shared with an amazing roommate in a small university town. I didn't get too many requests, but all reviews were positive. What's important to notice is that couch surfers were sleeping with me in the same room on an inflatable mattress. Of course, I would always vet hosts and guests before accepting or sending requests, trying to filter out weirdos and creeps, and my system seemed to work. Fast forward to the last person that I ever hosted, I had spent the night in another city with a group of friends. We had gone to a concert, slept at a friend's house, and took a train back home the next morning. We were all visibly hungover, wearing sweatpants and no makeup. In my country, the train ticket is cheapest if you travel in a group of five, an incentive to not use the car. So, waiting in front of the ticket machine to find more people to share the ticket with was very common. We were three broke students and happy to add two more people. During the train ride, I started to chat with one of the guys on our ticket, a traveler with a tent and a huge backpack who was not connected to the other person on our ticket. This backpacker told me that he was from New Zealand. He was in his early 30s, which was probably a lie since he looked older and that he had been traveling through Europe for the past eight months with no plan of going back anytime soon. We ended up chatting a little bit about travel, philosophy, cultural differences, and etc. throughout the whole train ride. Nothing out of the ordinary. I mentioned that I had a boyfriend, a long-distance relationship, very early on in the conversation and this will be important for later. After a while, this guy came up with couch surfing and asked if I was familiar with the concept. Being the proud CS veteran that I was, I started listing all the people that I'd ever hosted and all the places that I'd ever stayed at. He bluntly asked me if I would be able to host for him for a couple of nights because he was interested in my student town. I was a little hesitant at first, but I guess my brain was not functioning properly to tell him no directly. I called my roommate to ask if she would be home and whether she was okay with a guest. She didn't mind, and I told him that I could host him for this night only because I had stuff for university to finish the next day. First and easiest chance to avoid this creep missed. The train arrived 
we went home to drop our stuff off and proceeded with a quick tour throughout the old town. Bear in mind that I was still hungover and I haven't had the time to take a rest. He didn't seem too interested in the city tour and asked me if we could go shopping instead. We ended up in H&M where he bought a t-shirt and some underwear. He kept asking for my opinion on color and style before buying things. A little strange, but fair enough. Afterwards, he tagged along when I went grocery shopping for dinner, where I also bought two bottles of wine. While still out, he asked if he could stay longer, but I declined. Overall, he made me feel a little uncomfortable, but I brushed it off, telling myself that it was only one night and that he would be gone by tomorrow. And yeah, there goes my second chance to give him the boot. At home, he took a shower that lasted well over an hour. I really thought he was trying to drown himself in there. When he finally came out of the bathroom that had turned into a steam room, he was wearing his new t-shirt and also the underwear, which I would find out later. In the meantime, I was in the kitchen preparing dinner and my roommate had arrived home. He then lounged in my room charging his phone and using my computer to look up where he wanted to go next. This was before smartphones were widely used. When I went back to my room, I casually asked him for his profile on couch surfing, the very reason why he was sitting in this very room. He casually replied that he had deleted his account a while ago. What the hell? Why would a person backpacking through Europe delete their account? It didn't make any sense, and in hindsight, I should have kicked him out then and there, no further questions asked. But it was already evening, and I wrongfully felt like I had to be a good host until the next morning. What a big mistake and third chance that I missed. Dinner was fine overall. We ate and shared a bottle of wine in three. My roommate, however, couldn't stay with us for longer because she worked in the hospital and had to wake up really early, which is helpful for later. The couch surfer creep stayed seated at the table and reminded me that I had bought another bottle of wine, which should be opened now. I politely told him that I was done drinking for the night. Remember the hangover? Yeah. But I told him that if he wanted, I could open the second bottle for him alone. I thought he would decline, but I was wrong, obviously. He proceeded to drink half of the second bottle, and once he noticed my liquor collection, he tried to convince me to do shots with him. I gave him the same reply as before, and he went for two or three shots while I was watching him. The quality of the conversation downspined rapidly, and I said that I would stay in the kitchen for a little bit to do the dishes or work for university and invited him to relax in my room in the meantime, which is a translation for leave me alone and go sleep. I was seriously not in the mood for dishes or work, but I figured that it would be better than talking to him. This plan didn't work out because he kept bouncing back and forth between kitchen and room trying to strike a conversation again. I was not very interested though, and eventually, he gave up and went to sleep around midnight. Once I heard him snoring, I went to bed as well. All good, you might think. Well, far from it. During the night, I had a weird sensation. It felt like something on my mattress was moving. I later found out that the guy had reached over from his mattress to pull on one corner of my bed sheets in an attempt to wake me up. At night, however, I wasn't aware of this yet, but it kept me drifting in and out of sleep. Around 4 a.m., the couch surfer decided to go to the bathroom. Once he came back, instead of going back to his bed, 
He stood at the end of mine, staring at me for several minutes, while I was wide awake but pretended to be asleep. At this point, I freaked out internally and I was cursing myself for my naivety on the train. Eventually, he went back to his bed but immediately started whispering repeatedly, Are you awake? Um, are you awake? Hey, are you awake? I figured that I had to answer and pretended to just have been woken up and asked in an annoyed voice what he wanted. He replied, Well, I woke up and I have a lot of energy in me. I want to use it up. I answered him, and why are you telling me this? He said, Well, I know you have a boyfriend, but it's really difficult as a guy to travel alone for such a long time. I just told him that this wasn't my problem. I jumped out of bed and went to the kitchen. No way was I going to stay with him in the same room after he admitted on wanting to use up his energy. He followed me to the kitchen and asked why I was no longer in bed. I answered that I didn't feel comfortable with him in the same room anymore and I would like him to leave as early as possible. He pointed at the t-shirt and the underwear that he was wearing and said, I only bought those for you and spent 30 bucks for nothing. I simply shrugged and opened my laptop to distract myself. Instead of packing his stuff and leaving immediately, he was restless, bouncing between kitchen, bathroom, and my room, doing a series of weird things that I don't all remember. The top three of those were washing his hands and face at least ten times in a row, filling a glass with water, circling it around, and pouring it back into the sink repeatedly with the water running from the tap. And when I asked him about what the fuck he was doing, he came awfully close to me, looking me into my eyes and intensely saying, Some things from the childhood, they remain, and you can never go back and can't change them. While he said that, he looked like the male version of this crazy girlfriend beam. This last thing really freaked me out, but thankfully, that was the time that my roommate woke up and entered the scene. I quickly filled her in about the night's events in a language that the guy didn't speak. Finally, he got the message that there wouldn't be any energy use up time and then started packing. My guest eventually grabbed all of his stuff, turned around to look at a picture of my boyfriend and I, sighed and said, He's a lucky guy. But before finally going out of my door, he asked me for my number. My initial thought was to shout at him, like what was he thinking? But I figured, since he already knew where I lived, this additional information wouldn't make a difference but might make him leave. I reluctantly gave him my number and he immediately tried to ring me. Once he saw it was really my number, he visibly relaxed and was out of the door. The whole ordeal from watching me sleep to leaving lasted around two hours. He was completely mental, but thankfully not violent. The cherry on the top was when the creep called me a week later. I hadn't saved his number, and after he had said his name, I just asked if he was that crazy couch surfer who woke me up at dawn requesting sex and then told him to never call me again and hung up. He then sent me a text saying, You're the crazy one! And this was the last that I heard of him and the last time that I hosted a couch surfer in my apartment. So, creepy couch surfer, let's not meet again. This was 2.5 years ago. It was around 10 p.m. and I was walking towards a nearby bus station to go home. And I had to go through an area that is not known to be the best. That day, 
I was feeling really depressed and low, so I didn't care enough to be more careful. A guy walked up to me and said, Give me your wallet or I'll stab you. He was wearing sunglasses, had tiny tattoos beside his eyes, looked tear-shaped, but I'm not really sure. He had his hand in his sweatshirt pocket, and as I mentioned, I was depressed and also feeling passively suicidal. So this incident came across as annoyance to me. But I also felt shocked. Like, how could this happen to me? It felt surreal. I looked at him, annoyed and confused, and somehow managed to say, Are you serious right now? Like, no, dude. He kept staring at me and said, Yes. I maintained a glare, probably not smart, but didn't give in at all. A lady walked by with headphones on. I tried to call out to her, but she kept walking. I guess it makes sense since that area is sketchy and she probably didn't want to get involved. I could see a pastry shop in the distance and I wondered if I should call for help, accept it all, or just run. I decided that I should try reasoning with this guy. I remember getting my legs consciously ready to run in case the reasoning didn't work. I didn't want to give my wallet because I have my name, my address, and everything on my IDs in it. I didn't want to risk my family's address being out there. And of course, maybe that still wasn't the best choice. Anyways, I looked at him and kept a defensive stance. I had my hand out to maintain a gap between us. I asked him to calm down and tell me what's going on. And I kept repeating that I have no money, but if he's hungry, I can walk around the corner with him and get him some food. He said, I need cash. I told him that I have none, and I asked, What's going on? You sound distressed. Why do you need the money, man? Talk to me. He replied, I, I just do. I need to leave this city. I told him, I understand, man. Sometimes, shit gets tough and we need to get out, and I'm sorry I have no cash on me to help you, but the least that I can do is get you food. After that, it felt like we stood forever, but maybe 30 seconds passed, and then suddenly he said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. He then added, I don't have any actual knife in my pocket anyway, but still... I'm sorry. At this point, I tell him, Listen, man, I'm sorry you're going through tough times. I don't know your story, so I can't really pretend to understand it. But it's obvious you're going through tough times. I know it's hard to believe, but I really do hope it gets better for you. But I'll tell you that this method will land you in trouble and can cause irreversible damage. You seem like a sensible guy, so... I have a feeling that you can make better decisions, dude, okay? Yeah, just a random lecture moment. I genuinely felt some empathy for him to some level, but also felt like I needed to say whatever I could to get rid of him. He just nodded and said sorry. After that, I gave him a fist bump and told him, Oh, by the way, even if you had killed me today, I was thinking it would be okay because I don't really want to exist anyway. He awkwardly laughed and I said, Take care, dude. Peace. And he replied with something similar and he left. After that, I noticed my legs were shaking. Many thoughts crossed my mind. Did he let me go because I was assertive or convincing? Or was it solely because he had no knife? Should I have just given my wallet and not risk so much? There is no perfect answer. And I'm always curious to hear what others would have done. What would your reaction be? So, I'm not a very good storyteller. 
but I'll try my best to make this coherent. I was, I think, about seven or eight at that time. Me and my friend, who was eleven or twelve, pretended to have a secret club, and our clubhouse was in the small forest clearing, less than one kilometer by 1.5 kilometer area in the city. Since I was only in the first or second grade in my country, my mom had put me in a place where kids would go after school to eat and play with other kids for a few hours before their parents were home since most kids got out of school between 12 to 14 when they are still so young. So that's the time that I played with my friend in the forest for some time before we invited one of his friends to join our little club. A few days after we had invited him, he told us about a weird man with a black dog that had harassed him while being in the forest alone. So, as young kids, we took his story and after it, every time we saw a dog walker, we checked if they had a black dog. So one day, when we finally saw one, we walked out of the forest immediately to an apartment complex nearby. The yard the apartment complex had was sealed by gates on one side and was open on the other. So we thought that we would go in from the open side and crawl under the gate from the other and then run back to the after school thing, which I don't know if other countries have, so I don't know what to call it. So after we had crawled under the gate, we debated for a moment if we would go through the forest or around it. We decided on going through since it would be faster. We were about halfway through the hill to the forest, constantly checking our backs to see if the man was following, and to our horror, we saw him running up the hill towards us without his dog, and to this day, I wonder where he had left his dog, but that's irrelevant. My friend told me to run as fast as I can back to the place, and luckily, Neither of us fell down, since the forest has moats left from wars and a steep hill on the other side where the building was. We ran inside and told only one person, and they obviously didn't believe us. And after that encounter, we stayed inside for under 30 minutes before leaving, constantly feeling like we were being watched from the trees. After I left because I was scared, I went to my friend's house since I didn't want to go home yet and my other friend just went home. On the way there, I ran into another friend of mine and he told me that our common friend had called him telling that some guy had went in there with a knife shouting or some shit. I didn't tell many people and the ones I've told haven't believed me. I really don't know how to end this. But fuck, that time scared me. Creepy Neighbor by U slash Marlusa91 There have been many situations in my life that could have been avoided if I chose to be an asshole instead of being nice and well-mannered. It goes without saying that this situation would have been avoided if I let go of the idea that I should always be polite. This is not a story of assault or life-threatening danger, but it was definitely creepy and in my mind, it could have escalated to something more serious. The situation went like this. I used to be very friendly with an elderly man in my neighborhood. I felt bad because he seemed really lonely as he never had any company. At first, he would want a hug every time he saw me, which I didn't think was strange because hugging as a greeting or goodbye is very common from where I came from. He eventually asked if he could ask for my mobile number in case anything happens and if he needs help. 
He told me he had suffered a stroke years ago, and both he and his wife were prone to falls that would result in broken bones. So, I gave him my mobile number. I would want someone to help my elderly relatives if they needed help in an emergency. He would then frequently ring my doorbell to share leftover food with me, which I appreciated at that time. Then, he would come to my apartment almost daily and ring my doorbell until I answer the door. He once rang six times. He also once invited himself into my apartment when I opened the door and proceeded to remove his shirt to show me a scar on his chest. I told him that I believed him when he said that he had a scar and he did not need to undress. He took off his shirt anyway. If he did not see me for more than a day or two, he would call me to see where I was and what I was doing. By this point, when he would hug me, he would sometimes lightly bounce up and down or rock side to side. When that would happen, I would push away and tell him that I don't need a hug. I would make up an excuse like I had a cold or flu-like symptoms. Well, this was pre-pandemic, and I did not want to spread anything to him. Shortly after this, three separate things happened on separate days that make my skin crawl when I think back on them. First, he put his hands on the sides of my head, gently squeezed, rubbed his hands on my hair, and pulled my head towards his. I extended my hand against his shoulder and gently pushed away. I told him that I am not a touchy person and I don't really like to be grabbed. This is not true and not something I was saying in the moment. Second, he ran his fingers through my hair after I gently pushed away from his dancing hug. I told him again that I am not the type of person who likes physical affection. And last, he gave me a regular hug, no weird movements, but then caressed my face with his hand and pinched my nose. I felt so uncomfortable and gross, I pushed away and told him that I had to get back to work. He slowly but firmly grabbed my arm and tried to initiate another hug. I pushed him away again, and I told him that I do not need another hug. Each of these three things happened in my apartment, not on the sidewalk in plain view of others. After the last encounter, I made the decision to never allow him within arm's reach of me again. I felt and still feel that his actions were gradually escalating. I did not care to let things escalate any further. When he would see me walking my dog and approaches, I would quickly walk the other way and not respond to him. He eventually realized that I was avoiding him and followed me back to my apartment. He asked me if it was something he said, and I was direct and told him that I do not like being touched yet he insisted on touching my face and hair in ways that made me uncomfortable. He responded with, I wish you said something. I did, multiple times, and he still tries to talk to me when he sees me walking my dog, but I continue to completely ignore him. There are individuals who take advantage of certain assumptions younger people tend to make. I made the assumption that I should be unquestionably kind and social with this man since he was elderly and lonely. I made an assumption that my neighbor was just a vulnerable and frail person. I made the assumption that nothing threatening would happen due to his fragile health. And I admit, it's entirely possible that I am reacting too much. So... How does this pertain to being an asshole sometimes, instead of always being a well-mannered female? 
The truth is that I did begin to feel uncomfortable long before those three incidents took place. I felt uncomfortable enough to ignore him when he would ring my doorbell again and again, and I felt uncomfortable enough to ignore his phone calls. I felt uncomfortable the moment he gave that first dancing hug. Yet, every time, I chose to ignore that feeling of discomfort as it would have been seen as me being impolite to an elderly person. In those moments, I valued the optics of good manners more than what my gut was telling me. I will always choose to be kind to others, but going forward, I will be more alert and no longer choose appearing to be polite over my own sense of safety. Creepy Old Neighbor Insist that I have a margarita by you slash Gucci underscore Romaine. Hey guys, I thought I feel like I can post this now as my weird and creepy neighbor moved out two weeks ago. I'll give you some background first. I moved into my apartment pretty quick to escape a bad roommate situation. I didn't get to do my normal checks on the area but I figured it would be okay because I was relatively familiar with the area. I live in a quadplex and have a bottom one-bedroom apartment. I thought that everything should be fine because I had seen what I thought was all of the other tenants when I went to look at the apartment. Well, I had not seen everyone. My direct upstairs neighbor was a greasy white man that was beer belly fat and he was in his mid-sixties and gave me a really bad gut feeling. When I moved in, I also worked kind of odd hours and I would be getting home between 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. depending on which job I was working. I am a fairly quiet person as well. I occasionally listen to music on a speaker, but it's always a moderate volume and during the day. I came home one night at around 11 p.m. and had entered my house and was trying to make some leftovers for dinner and watching a video on my phone. When my direct upstairs neighbor, we'll call him Kevin, came down the stairs and was banging on my door and repeatedly ringing my doorbell. He was making like a thousand times more noise than I had been collectively over the month that I had been there. I answered the door and he was pissed, saying that I need to stop banging around and quiet hours were at 10 p.m. and that I was being inconsiderate and many more. I was not making any noise outside of normal living noises, the banging was me shutting my car door once. This set the tone for our relationship going forward. He would get pissed at me coming home from work and closing my car door because he said it would wake him up. I tried to explain that I don't control my work schedule and he could also try to not sleep with every single window open in his apartment and then maybe the noise wouldn't be loud or noticeable. He vehemently hated that. Another few months go by, and Kevin comes down to my apartment, holding two margaritas, and tries to be all, I'm sorry, we started off on the wrong foot, let's make amends, and all other excuses. But he was being kind of weird, and it seemed like he was trying way too hard to hide his excitement or something. I agreed and said that if he has a problem, we can discuss it like normal adults and vice versa. He was a little too eager to agree and tried to give me the second margarita. I declined because I was underage and I don't accept drinks from strangers. He insisted and practically shoved the margarita in my hand. 
I felt super uneasy and reluctantly accepted. He almost demanded that I drink it as a toast to our newfound civility. I pretend to take a sip. I ended the conversation and closed and locked my door. I dumped the margarita and felt really grossed out by the whole situation. I'm fairly certain that he attempted to drug me, and I don't even want to think about what he would have done if I had drank the margarita. I'm so glad he moved out. So, creepy neighbor Kevin, let's not meet again. Higher drunk guy try to stab me and my family by you slash Sirkin Weeps. Yeah, that's not clickbait. It's been ages since I hopped on Reddit, but here I am to bring a story to you all that happened not too long ago. And while it happened to me, it didn't start with me, but my mother, though somehow I became the focus of it. A couple weeks ago, my mom was coming back from the store at around 10 p.m., got herself a pack of cigarettes, and was hanging out with a friend of hers as she did so. On their way back, they came across Jeremy. It was a guy they have both, and even I, have seen a couple times. Nothing major, just an acquaintance that we all barely spoke to. Though... He was either high as hell at this time, or drunk, or both, I don't know. I do know, this wasn't how he usually acts. Jeremy was angry over something, and came up to them and started screaming about wanting to do something to them, and then pulled his package out, in public, and after both my mom and her friend tried to just walk out of the situation, he started attacking my mom. Both my mom and her friend started fighting back and they managed to get him to stop and made their way back to her house, where I currently am at, unaware of what the hell is going on. However, note that I said stop and not leave. He lived in the same building as I do and was following them from a distance. So, they both made their way upstairs. When my mom realized she had left her key inside, nothing new. She was pretty forgetful, and I'm generally here to open the door when she does. Problem being, Jeremy made his way upstairs too past where his floor is, and on to ours. And he tried to fight her again. I opened the door to my mom shouting my name and being absolutely clueless as she entered and tried to close the door. But Jeremy pushed the door open before it could even be shut and made his way into her apartment. This is where I got involved. I grabbed a knife and threatened him to get out, which he did. And I have no idea how he managed to get this impression, but he seemed to think that I was trying to fight him, because after we made sure to slam the door the moment he exited and locked it, he started screaming at the top of his lungs about how we were pussies and to call the police, claiming that he knows the landlord and he can get him to delete any footage caught from the outside of the building and the hallways inside my building. My mom, being a quick thinker, started recording him from the door as he banged and kicked the door trying to open it. Eventually, he left when he heard that we actually were calling the cops. You think this would be over, right? Nope. It keeps going. After a couple of minutes, he returns to the door with a knife and starts stabbing our door while screaming and insulting us at the top of his lungs, saying that he will kill the cops too. The police can clearly hear him from the phone, 
and I think that's why they came this time around. Since, as I mentioned in my last Reddit post, that these guys are absolutely useless. The doors in this building are strong stuff. Metal, I think? I don't know. But while he made some light holes and scratches, he couldn't do too much to it. So he shouts that he will be downstairs waiting for the cops, which we of course inform the cops currently on the phone of. And like perfect timing, while he makes his exit, they make their entrance both using two different elevators, as our building had two. Four officers knocked on our door and we opened up and told them what was going on and what happened from start to finish. While my mom showed the cops the footage she recorded, I was taking pictures of the damages to the door. The cops, clearly not wanting to be here, begrudgingly said to come downstairs with them. So, me and my mom did, to which we heard screaming from the first floor. We're on the fifth floor, and we heard him perfectly. Though his screaming stopped real quick when four cops showed up, he instantly went, Oh, shit! and played nice with the cops. The cops were not having any of it and arrested Jeremy there and then. His friends were eventually there asking what did he do and screaming and shouting at the cops before eventually running off. Jeremy was taken away. I sent the damages of the door to lawyers and I don't know what happened about that. Silence. Just silence. So, this is where the story ends, right? Nope. Jeremy got off with a restraining order, and though since he lived in the same building as us, we couldn't stop him from simply being in the building. He was only not allowed to talk to us or cause any problems. This did not last long. On my way to the store maybe two weeks later, he and his friends were all outside the building in a group, chatting and drinking, and when I walked out, Jeremy instantly switched off the topic, saying, You see that kid? I'm gonna mess him up. He got the cops on me. I wanted to get away from that as soon as possible, but I had already left the building and would need to get close to the group that I just finished taking my first couple steps away from in order to get back inside. So, I quickly made my way to the store, since I would be in public with people present. I end up just getting everything I need from the store while trying to call my mom to tell her what happened. But she didn't answer. Ah. <sighs> Great. And here is where I admit that I was a little dumb. I should have instantly called the cops, but I didn't. I didn't remember what Jeremy was wearing, and I am honestly a wreck with anxiety. I wanted to first see if the group was still there before I attempted to make a phone call. They weren't, and I quickly made my way upstairs to and informed my mom who calmed me down and got me to call the police. The exact same police as last time showed up, and thank God for that, since they were all well aware of Jeremy being a nutcase from last time. But this time, we had no proof, other than what would just end up being a he-said-she-said said scenario. So... They had us sit in the hallway while they called their boss to make sure that the arrest would be okay due to the previous history and restraining order. All the while, Jeremy was in the staircase laughing and being extremely loud with his friends and his sister from what I later learned. Eventually, the police got an okay from their boss and we all made our way to the staircase. I tried to stay out of sight as possible as they once again arrested him. Jeremy claimed to be unaware of what he was being arrested for, and his friends left once again. 
His sister, who was in her mid-twenties from what I could guess, was screaming though, insulting them and saying that he was being arrested for no reason. Jeremy was holed away again, and I have no idea what happened. No calls from attorneys or the police, no nothing. Though I ended up seeing him within the week, straying from eye contact with me and my family. He usually walks away the moment he sees us. I wish more came of this, but I'm happy that we are being left alone all the same. Though, he is always pissed at seeing me. The time a creepy neighbor tried to stab me by you slash funfetti underscore dragon. This happened in 2008 when I was 9 years old. I lived in a townhome community where each road had two sides of homes. In between the back of the houses, there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these, and my townhome was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street and across the back road on the opposite side lived an elderly woman whose name I don't even know. I'm not sure what her situation was, but for whatever reason, she never liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray-painted all of her windows so no one could see in her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out of her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell at how she hated us. I was in the fourth grade and on a particular January morning, I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so he could drive me, and he said that he'd follow me out soon. As I was walking to my dad's car, she came out of the alleyway next to my house, slowly, with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and started running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and was able to get into the house. She walked and stood onto the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her, and she said that she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police but the police sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it, but I don't really know the details. I didn't see her again after that, until one year later. I don't remember the day, but it had snowed that morning, so I was going to run out of the front door and play in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch. But looking out towards the road, I panicked. I closed and locked the door and I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened. And we saw her walk off the porch up the street. I never saw her again after that. And my family has since moved far away from there. But people I know say that she still lives there. And her windows are still the same spray-painted windows. Though it doesn't affect me as much as it used to, I still don't like being around knives. My old neighbor who broke into my house when I was 11 to hide from the cops, let's not meet by you slash paranoid and geeky. So, when I was 11, I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood. To paint a picture, there were very common street races, gunfights, and fight clubs around. I actually was tricked into joining one at one point, 
and never could leave my house after I didn't go back. All this in mind, I hated being home alone, and my parents knowing this allowed me to have a friend over whenever they would be out late to keep me calm as I had or have heavy anxiety. I had a neighbor who was a boy around my age, maybe a little older, and when I went outside to play or walk my dog, he would talk to me, so he wasn't a complete stranger, and we'll call him R.A. or Runaway. One day, my parents were going out on a date night and would be out really late around 2 to 3 a.m., so they said that I could have a sleepover with my best friend. All was going well, and we were playing some video games in the living room. When suddenly, around midnight, my neighbors started crawling through my dining room window. As someone who has heavy anxiety, I was prepared for such a situation and had a knife on me, and I instructed my best friend to get my dog since he is fiercely protective. I wasn't scared of this kid since I've seen him fight and I figured that I could take him if I needed to with all my precautions in place. The conversation isn't word for word, but it went similar to this. I said, What the hell? Why are you crawling through my window? What do you want? R.A. answered, Whoa, <laughs> relax. I just wanted to hang out with you and your friend. I could hear you laughing from my house and I wanted to join in. I told him, You're not supposed to be here. My mom and dad would get mad. R.A. answered, I just want to hang out for a little bit, get some food, play some games. Come on. Then he refused to leave, and I don't remember most of what I said. I didn't feel threatened and I decided to let him stay since he wouldn't take no as an answer. He stole a good amount of my food too. One thing I noticed was he was avoiding the windows, but he didn't make it obvious, so I tried not to think about it since I was scared. He went home after about an hour, and my friend and I didn't think much of it. The next morning, I was in the front yard doing God knows what when I see R.A. getting his ass beat and screamed by his older sister. I laughed and asked what he did, and she told me something that made my blood freeze. She told me that he was hiding from the cops as he beat some kids so bad he sent him to the hospital and damaged some property at the school where the fight took place. I avoided that house and those kids as much as possible, and we moved shortly after that. So, kid who ran away from the cops and into my house, let's not meet. Another Uber Story by U slash QQMats This happened back in 2019 when I was living in a small town in western Massachusetts. I had bought concert tickets, which included a meet and greet for one of my favorite metal bands. They were performing at the Palladium on a September afternoon and I worked in a town 45 minutes away from where the concert was happening. I had everything arranged for the big day. Unfortunately, my car broke down days prior to the concert and the renting car place did not have available vehicles for that weekend. Concert pal Jamal was working in Boston that day and he was going to meet me at the concert instead. Due to the circumstances, I decided to book an Airbnb for Jamal and I to stay for the night. I ended up taking the bus after my shift at the hospital ended. I arrived to the bus terminal and requested an Uber to take me to my Airbnb place, 
where I was planning to take a nap and change clothes before heading out to the concert. A great Toyota Corolla that matched the description arrived, and a very young guy greeted me and started the usual conversation. I gave him vague answers, but it was inevitable for him to notice that I was a doctor as I was still wearing my blue scrubs and Crocs. Ten minutes into the drive, the driver offered to buy me food at Chick-fil-A. I politely refused him, but he ended up going to the drive through because it was on the way and bought me a sandwich and soda in spite of my refusal. He started asking me if I was single and the reason why I was visiting the city and if I was traveling alone. I vaguely told him about the concert, avoiding giving much details. But the driver then started talking about how he was driving one of his friends to Boston and it was a shame that he couldn't take me to the concert place but that he can drive me back to my Airbnb after the show ended for free. I didn't say anything. I was too distracted looking for the instructions on how to access the Airbnb that I missed the driver saving my phone number in his phone. After the concert, Jamal went to the parking lot to retrieve the car. In the meantime, I continued chatting with some girls that I befriended until I received a call from an unknown number. I ignored it, and I continued talking. My phone kept ringing, and I answered, thinking maybe it was someone from the hospital, because I did not have my work phone with me. After the fifth time, I picked up and I recognized the voice of the Uber driver, who was inviting me to a friend's party, and that he was on his way to pick me up. My gut feeling was telling me how fishy the situation was, and I firmly said no, and then hung up. Two minutes later, the Uber driver texted to let me know that he was five minutes away and that I needed to wait for him. I paled after reading the text, and one of the girls noticed how nervous I was getting. Telling her my situation and showing her the text, she and her boyfriend decided to keep me company until my friend's car appeared in the corner. Saturday morning came by, and during breakfast, and while chatting about the concert, Jamal mentioned that Jason, one of the guys we met at the concert, sent him a Facebook message asking if we were okay. It seems that after we left, a group of four men in a gray car approached them asking about me. They decided to play dumb, telling them that they haven't seen anybody with my characteristics and walked away. We reported him to Uber and then deleted the app. I kept receiving random calls from unknown numbers at odd hours in the night. I decided to change my phone number and avoid unnecessary trouble. And since that day, no more Uber for me. Fake Uber Driver Try to Pick Up My Boyfriend and I By you slash Alien underscore Bob In Myrtle Beach in 2016, my boyfriend and I had ordered an Uber from our hotel to the restaurant. When you get an Uber, the type of car, a picture of the driver, and their name are usually visible on the app. We were waiting on an older gentleman driving a little white sedan to come get us when a dumpy looking van pulls up. There was a man behind the wheel and a man in the passenger seat and two in the back. One of the men in the back slid the van door open and asked, Are you? While saying my boyfriend's name, and as soon as we saw how many people were in the van, and that none of them were the picture of the man on the app, we immediately knew something was off. First off, 
Uber has a rule where you can't have non-customer passengers in the car with you when making pickups. And second, the whole situation just felt fishy to both of us because nothing matched what the app said. My boyfriend lied and said that we were not the ones that called in Uber, and they slammed the door and drove off. A few minutes later, our actual Uber driver pulled up. We told him what had happened, and he said that it wasn't the first time that he heard stories from customers like that. And I have never forgotten that, and wonder what would have happened had we gotten into that van that day. We have also never figured out and how they knew my boyfriend's name, unless they had hacked into Uber's database somehow to access current Uber requests. If anyone has any other ideas about how he would know his name, please let me know. But the moral of the story is, always be cautious if your Uber driver shows up and the car or driver do not match what the app says. He wasn't my Uber driver by you slash script tonight. This happened to me a few years ago. It was New Year's Eve and I had just been out in the city to celebrate with three of my closest girlfriends. At the end of the evening, when we were all exhausted and ready for bed, one of our friends traveled to her house near the club, while the others made the hour-long trek back to our home suburb. There were three of us together, and all females. The trip to our suburb typically involved a 45-minute long bus trip, and then an Uber or a taxi to our houses. I have lived in that area my entire life, and I am very familiar with the most convenient way to get to and from my house. On this particular evening, we got off the bus, and I booked an Uber with my phone. It was around 4 a.m., so you can imagine our remote town had very little road traffic at this time. A car pulls up at the bus stop. And as this was the first car we had seen since arriving, and no one else was around except us, we assumed it was our ride and got in. Our Uber driver was a Russian man, with a very thick accent, although he didn't speak a lot. Immediately, I noticed that he was taking us the wrong direction of my house, but I figured it's fine. Sometimes, GPS takes drivers on different routes, and I brushed off the thought of it. Then, ten minutes later, I get a text that my Uber driver is arriving at my pickup destination. I look at the driver beside me, angry that I was too tired or intoxicated to remember the text message you receive before your ride pulls up. But also terrified that I may have gotten my two best friends and myself into a vehicle with a man we didn't know at all. My actual Uber driver then tried to call me, presumably to find out where we were, but I ignored the call, not wanting to alert the man who had actually picked us up. At that point, I still hadn't said anything to my best friends. But I asked the driver if he will stop at a service station so I can grab a drink of water before we continue the journey, because I felt sick. He questioned me. We aren't far from your destination now. But I insisted, so he agreed. When we arrived at the service station, I asked my friends to get out with me desperately, and they obliged. I explained the situation to them and we all agreed to tell the driver that we were going to walk to a friend's house nearby and not to worry about the rest of the trip. He seemed frustrated and insisted that he take us, but we refused to get back in the car. 
we ended up getting a cab back home from there. So, Uber driver, who may not have actually been an Uber driver, let's not meet. The Stalker Uber Driver by U slash Ether08 This happened a couple of months ago, December of last year. I started working a new job in the mall and had to work for most of Boxing Day. I was done at 10pm and transit seemed to have ended at 7pm. I'm a student who didn't go home for the holidays due to this job and never had to deal with holiday transit hours. I decided to call an Uber, and the driver picked me up right in front of the mall. We had a casual conversation during the drive back, and he learned about where I worked and how I'm living on my own for the time being since my roommates went to their hometowns. Fast forward to the next day at work at around 6 p.m., this driver walks into the store and tries to strike a conversation with me. But I told him that I had to get back to work. He also asked if we could hang out later, to which I said no, and then he left. At the end of that shift, around 10 p.m., I walked out of the store planning to take transit, and as soon as I stepped out of the store, the driver immediately pulled up next to me and offered to give me a free ride back home. After going back and forth with me declining and him saying that it's free, I decided to walk away and caught a bus home. I was pretty overwhelmed by the fact that he showed up to my workplace and waited three hours until I was done work to offer me a ride home. I've reported this to Uber, and they've notified me that they have suspended this driver. They provided me a full refund and gave me a link to provide to the police if I plan on filing a report. Silly of me to give away information like that to a stranger, but I hope to never meet that driver again, who appeared twice my age, knows where I work, and live, and this is a lesson learned, 110%. Anonymize Think twice about ordering Uber pools by you slash jaded monk. This just occurred this past November. A close friend and I were on fall break from college and decided to go to an Odessa concert in downtown Chicago. We grew up in the suburbs, so going to Chicago to have fun was common for us. Anyways, we had a great time at the concert and decided to Uber home since we weren't close to the train station. My friend told me Uber wasn't working for him at that moment, so I called the Uber. But this was literally my first time ever calling one, and I accidentally called an Uber pool, not knowing what it was. My friend saw that and was like, Eh, it doesn't really matter. So, the driver picks us up from right outside the concert venue. There were a lot of intoxicated people around, as one could imagine post-Odessa's show. But we were pretty sober, as all we did was smoke some weed, which we were used to. We get in the car, and everything is going normal but we didn't notice the direction the driver was taking us as we were warped in talking about the show. Turns out, the driver was going to the south side of Chicago, which we realized after some time by looking at maps. But our suburb was exactly the opposite direction of this lengthy drive south. We decided to attribute this to the fact that it was an Uber pool, and then shrugged it off. 
until we picked up this next passenger. To be honest, this girl scared us. I don't like to judge people, but she scared us just by looks and how she talked. Once the girl got on, we asked the driver if we were going first, to which she stopped answering. Next thing I know, my phone lit up and said that the Uber trip was cancelled. And for this duration of the ride, Uber had no record of me being in the car. I asked the driver what the deal was. And he didn't answer. The girl and the driver 100% knew each other as they were calling each other nicknames. The girl was being weird and seemed to be doing some hand signals to him. Then we proceeded to drive further south to this neighborhood. The sketchiest neighborhood that I have ever seen. I didn't realize neighborhoods like this even existed. Every house was completely wrecked and there were no street signs on most streets. And most street lights were out flickering. Homeless people lying on sidewalks and there were beat down warehouses and alleys. This was by far the scariest area that I've ever seen. No one who cared would hear a scream in this area. Once we started seeing all of this, our hearts dropped because the driver would still not respond to us. My friend then looked over to me and whispers, We need to get the hell out of here. To which I replied, Dude, look where we are. And so we stayed in the car. Then, we then get driven down this alley behind a warehouse where the streets ended and there were just fields beyond it. The driver is going down this alley at like 2 meters per hour, but keeps going. The girl and Uber driver were clearly discussing something serious, but we couldn't make out since they were using mostly signals. And at that time, our heart sank even more and we literally both thought that we were going to be killed in this alley, or at best, someone was going to get in the car and rob us. He stopped. The doors unlocked, and I was in complete shock with a pale face when all of a sudden my friend says, Hey, I'm completely sober, and I'm about to call 911. I'm assuming the driver was waiting around the concert to pick up some wasted people to allow this to happen, but we were pretty sober, which he was serious about. He had 911 dialed up on his phone, and the Uber driver looks back at us in shock after he sees 911 dialed and my friend's finger about to push call. He looks at the girl and the girl is in shock too, and she nods her head no and says, What the hell, right? Which was the driver's nickname, and then gets out of the car. The driver then drives out of the neighborhood and onto the highway towards our suburb. All of a sudden, my Uber app gave me a notification saying that we were now in a ride. All of a sudden, the driver starts talking to us again, but he wasn't giving any answers, just saying that he is driving us home. We were asking what the hell just happened, and he wouldn't answer stuff like that. He would answer about where we were going, but nothing about what just happened. We got home safely and reported the Uber driver for this ride because it was obviously messed up. We think that the Uber driver was trying to wait for wasted people to call a pool so he could get away with this, but realized that we were too big of a risk when it came to do what they were going to do. We've accepted that we were part of a mugging scheme and got lucky when we decided not to get drunk at that concert. We had anxiety for weeks after this, but we now know just how sketchy some areas can be and how to be more safe in Chicago. Of course, by not calling an Uber pool outside a concert or bar. It's so weird to me that people live this sketchy kind of lives and do this to people. 
but it was eye-opening. So, let's not meet Rai ever again, or any Uber pool for that matter. I drive Uber a couple hours a week to earn some extra cash, you know, pay for my insurance, and etc. I'm not a big drinker, so it always works out well for me when I go out with friends late at night. I get to go out and hang out for a bit, and then earn some extra cash on the return trip home. But one thing to keep in mind is that the Uber app does not tell you where the expected destination of a trip is before you accept it. So, if someone is requesting to be dropped off in an extremely sketchy area, you have no idea until you have already accepted the trip and the person is literally in the backseat of your car. Super shady, and in my opinion, it should be illegal for Uber to do that. But I digress. Number one. About a month ago, I was driving home in exactly such a scenario. It was around 1 a.m. and I had dropped off a couple people already. When I saw somebody had requested a ride about five minutes away, I decided that I would pick up this guy and then head home. Unfortunately, the pickup location of this gentleman was in a not-so-nice part of town. When I pulled up, the guy was not waiting outside, which I was mildly annoyed about. But as I looked around the sketchy apartment complexes, I figured that I couldn't blame him for not wanting to stand around out in the open. Finally, about five minutes later and a late fee, the guy finally comes out and hops into the back seat. He was an African-American gentleman that looked to be near my age. Where are you headed? I asked him. Post office, he muttered back to me. This instantly made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Why would somebody be going to the post office at 1 a.m.? To my knowledge, Nobody worked a night shift at the post office. I decided to not ask any questions and commence the trip, which was about 10 minutes away. The post office was in the eastern part of my city and situated in a rather desolate part of town. Absolutely nobody other than myself and this guy were still out and about judging by the look of the streets and route. Finally, I pull up to the drive of the post office, which was tucked into an area located by what appeared to be a large abandoned factory, and I began to get worried. The entire complex was a large cement building with about half a football field of driveway to the factory next door. Even though only the moonlight was the sole source of light for me to see, I could make out the shape of four shadowy silhouettes at the end of the drive. It looked like they were standing there, waiting for the passenger in my car. This is it, I said. You can drop me off here. He responded, and got out of the car and began walking towards his four associates. I have no idea what he was doing that night, but I don't think he was mailing a letter. Number two. Another Uber experience is I was driving downtown, and this time, I got a call from a young man near my age. I drove to the location and parked my car next to a dilapidated bridge. I didn't see anyone waiting for the Uber, and I waited for a couple seconds until I received a phone call from the guy who ordered the Uber. The Uber, he explained, wasn't for him, but for his friends. I didn't like the sound of that, and something about the situation made me nervous. At times, I might be overly cautious, but I've learned to always trust my gut. I don't see your friends, 
I told him. The guy then starts describing them to me. They were two shaggy-looking men with big bushy beards, he said. I started scanning around the area, trying to determine if I could see anybody that matched that description, and I didn't see anyone. Nervous, I took my car out of the park and started pulling away from the curb with the idea that it would be best to just leave. Suddenly, as I was driving away, I saw some movement out of the corner of my eye. Two hobos with long beards and tattered clothes emerged from under the bridge and were walking towards my car. I instantly booked it and then canceled the ride. I realized that it was probably some guy who was trying to help out a couple of homeless people get to where they needed to go. But the situation absolutely seemed off to me, and I have no idea if the guys were on drugs and etc. And I don't regret canceling that ride at all. Disappearing Stacks in the Library by U slash Mentos and Coke 286 Mycologist Library has a very unique layout where there are floors between floors in the section of the library considered to be the stacks by the students. I've spent a lot of time in the library and I know the stacks very well as a result. A couple days ago, I was wandering through the stacks and into the between floors looking for something new to read or distract myself with and I stumbled across a section that I have never found before. It had every single book that I had ever wanted to read, but couldn't find previously, as well as seemingly hundreds of other texts that were just so relevant to my interest. I love to learn about huge variety of things, and this little corner had it all. Everything about it was so tempting like I could have stayed there forever. It felt fully unreal. Everything looked like the rest of the library, but the contents of the shelves were tailored only to my interest when there should have been something entirely different on the shelves according to the system that my library uses to categorize their books. I left quickly after that and realized a little more time had passed than I had planned to spend in the stacks. I was in there for hours and almost was late to one of my classes as a result of my expiration. The next day, I decided to go back and to try to find that part of the stacks again. I went through every section twice and I still couldn't find it. It fully disappeared. A friend of mine who works at the library told me that he's had some things like that happen to him too. So at least, I know it's not just me being crazy, and I have no idea what I stumbled upon. Disappearing Woman by U slash Beaumont underscore Livingston this happened back in 2015. I used to work at a pizza hut. It was takeout or delivery only type of pizza hut. And I used to work the late night shift around 9 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. From midnight to 2 a.m. on weekdays, there's very little to do and not many customers. Usually, I'm in the back on the computer just watching YouTube videos or whatever. But then I hear the entrance door chime, notifying me that someone has just walked in. It was about 1.30 a.m. It was a woman. She was dressed pretty nice, had on some really nice red bottom heels, and had on a very stylish navy blazer. She orders some chicken wings, garlic bread, some dip, and a two-liter coke. 
nothing out of the ordinary. I got everything together and placed it on the counter for her, and then told her, Enjoy, have a good night. She picked up the plastic bag with the wings and garlic bread and makes her way out. I was looking down on my cashier's screen to print out a receipt for our records and then look back up and notice that the two liter coke is still on the counter. The door entrance chime just rang as she turns right and I could see her feet just make it out of the frame of the window. So naturally, I grabbed the two liter coke and made my way outside to give it to her. I opened the door and turned right and was about to say something, but no one was there. There were no cars, no people, nothing. Mind you, this whole thing from seeing her leave the coke on the counter and grabbing the coke to give it to her probably happened in a span of two to four seconds. The pizza hut that I worked at was located in a plaza building with other businesses attached to it. Most of these businesses close anywhere from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. So, I walked down the sidewalk of the plaza adjacent to the pizza hut with the coke in my hand, looking into the other stores that she might have walked into. Though, every store was closed and it was dark inside with only the store signs illuminating the front of them. The doors were also locked. I knew there were some places still open this late at the plaza, so I walked down to the far end of the plaza where I knew there was a shawarma place open until 3 a.m. and I asked if they had seen a woman or if anyone had come in recently. And they said no. It was so strange because there were no cars in the plaza except for mine and the only explanation would be that she walked into one of the stores next to me. Though they were all locked. As well, I know the owners next door and she didn't seem like the type to have access like that. I thought maybe she got into a car right away and left, but that would be impossible as the plaza is large and for me not to see a car driving away would be damn near impossible. Theoretically, as she was leaving, I was almost immediately behind her. I should still see her, though it's as if she vanished into thin air. And to this day, I still can't seem to figure out what happened. Night Drive by user KWestProd I'd like to start by saying I was never one to believe in the Matrix or anything of the sort until this experience. I am trying to come to some sort of explanation aside from a glitch, but I have not been able to find any resolution to this. It's not scary, spooky, or some time traveler thrown through space-time to our dimension or timeline. Just... odd. I was driving through the streets near my house at around 9.30pm, so it was dark and oddly quiet for a weekend night. I live in a college town in Southern California with a vibrant nightlife, so not seeing a single car or pedestrian for the first three miles on major roads was extremely unusual. I didn't think much of it until I came down a large hill and around a bend at the bottom. It was a sweeping left bend with a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. I saw tail lights ahead right at the end of the bend. I noticed I was getting closer fast and checked my speed. 45 miles per hour. I slowed down quick and approached the cars ahead of me. I slowed down from 45 miles per hour to 10. The cars were stopped. No stoplight, stop sign, accident hazard animal, nothing. I realized they were all stopped in perfectly spaced out intervals, alternating between the left and right lane. I felt an odd sensation through my body, like a static vibration, what I would compare to TV static emanating from my bones the closer I crept up to the cars. All the cars were vehicles that did not come with a manual option, so they were all automatic transmission vehicles. 
None of the cars had brake lights on, stopped without engaging brakes. The sounds of the cars were non-existent. As I pulled up next to the car in the left lane, I crept up to look at the person in the car and as soon as I broke that perfectly spaced out interval, all the cars began moving at once. No engine starting, no gears being changed, no handbrakes being disengaged. Just a sudden movement by all seven cars. There was no slinky effect like traffic always has. All seven cars from front to rear began moving at the same exact time. That static feeling I had wore off the further I got from where the cars had stopped. I passed the cars once I had a chance, and all the drivers were expressionless, did not want to look at me, did not show any signs of acknowledgement of me or what just happened. Is this anything any of you could give insight to or know of happening? Thanks. Downward Road by U Slash Bonus Minutes Back when I was in college, probably 2012 to 2013, I experienced something weird with my friend. I went to a community college in New Jersey and I had met a lot of friends. One night, two guys that I didn't know super well but seemed cool wanted to chill. I'll call them Rourke and Eric. I drove the three of us to Eric's house for video games, movies, and for Rourke and I to spend the night. We were having fun, but around 2 a.m., Eric's dad inexplicably just said that Rourke and I couldn't spend the night. This was annoying because my place was at least 45 minutes drive away and I would need to drive Rourke home first, wherever that was. This part of the state is very rural with a bunch of thick forest roads and farmland, so everything is far apart there. So, begrudgingly, Rourke and I got into my car, and since Eric guided us to his place and neither Rourke and I knew where we were, I would need to GPS to his house. At that time, I still had a slider phone, not a smartphone, so I used one of those old TomTom -tom GPS units. We started on our way following the GPS instructions through the wooded roads, making small talk and whatnot. Before long, we ended up on a wooded road that the GPS didn't have a name for. The space for the road name was just blank, which I had never seen before. Less than a minute after we got on the road, the GPS lost signal. I didn't think much of it and just continued, figuring that it would just come back. The road started off normal and unremarkable, but it gradually got steeper and steeper downhill. Rourke and I commented on it, but just brushed it off. However, as the minutes passed, the road got more and more simple. Eventually, there were no guardrails, then it stopped having street lights, then it became a dirt road with no markings. Then, it narrowed for just enough space for a car one way. The forest on either side was hugging us, and aside from the dirt road, there were no signs of human influence. It's also worth noting that there was never an intersecting road to turn onto. It was a lone road, and we also never saw another car. Rourke and I were kind of nervously laughing about it, trying not to freak out. The decline had become very steep, and it was almost a perfectly straight road. I had considered trying to turn around, but at that point, the road was too narrow to turn around, and it would have been awful for my car to drive back up something so steep for so long. So... We just descended into the darkness, only able to see what my headlights showed. All in all, we probably went down for 15 to 20 minutes, and we were going decently fast. I doubt we went below 20 meters per hour, much faster a lot of the time so that I wasn't killing my brake pads. I feel as though we should have easily passed sea level. 
Eventually, the road evened out, guardrails and streetlights came back, and the GPS signal returned. And we just ended up on some side road like two minutes from Rourke's place. He insists that the road had never been there, and there was no mountain near his place for us to have descended. I ended up just crashing at Rourke's place. The next day, I drove back the way I came, and I could not find the strange road, nor could I find any road that was remarkably elevated. Fell asleep at the same time with the lights on, and woke up at the same time. By U slash Linuxy. I'm not sure if it exactly belongs here, but this happened when my partner was visiting me and he was staying over at my place for a couple of weeks in 2019. We had the lights on, just casually talking, and all of a sudden, we forget about what happened in that time frame and we just both woke up and we were shocked about how we even both fell asleep at the same time because the lights were on and we were both just facing the lights too. It was so bright when we both woke up. We were in a really uncomfortable position. He's a taller guy and he had his legs half off the bed and half on the bed. And I was in the same position. It was really strange. Also since we are both used to staying up since we play games all the time. But we woke up at around 9pm. At this time, I was in college and I didn't have a lot of money. So we didn't really do anything crazy that would have just knocked us out of exhaustion. We're also both introverts, so a party is definitely out of the question and both the type of people who need to have the lights off to even feel sleepy. We often joke around that the world ended and we just got teleported to a different one. Just trying to talk about what actually happened to both of us. It was really strange and we often talk about it still even to this day. What do you guys think? Have any of you gotten something similar? My first and last name was written on a box. I have no explanation why it was there. By user, Goof Off Corpse. I will try to be as brief as possible. My whole life I have suffered glitches, most of which revolve around a feeling that I am being watched. And the best description is like a real-life Truman Show. I know I'm not being watched, but sometimes things happen that are difficult to ignore. A few weeks ago, my girlfriend accidentally washed my vape pen. The pen was a Yokan Evolve Plus. I got it at a smoke shop near me about three years ago. It is used to vaporize marijuana concentrates. I use it when I am traveling. It is self-contained and very portable. I made plans to visit my daughter and grandchildren a few hours away from me, so I decided to stop by the same store and see if I could get a new one. On our way to my daughter's, my girlfriend and I stopped at the smoke shop. I walked in and asked the lady if they had the pen. She said they did not, and don't carry that type of device anymore, and really acted like she didn't know what I was talking about. I asked if they had anything that would be comparable, and she took me to a glass case in the corner of the shop. Things were kind of piled on top of each other in there. As the lady was moving stuff around, I noticed two boxes that said Yokan on the side. I asked to see them, and she said, Oh, I didn't know we had those. There was a kind of pinkish one and a black one. I said I wanted the black one, and she tried to talk me out of buying it. She said the other one was more silver than pink, and she thought it looked nicer. I reiterated that I wanted the black one. She rung it up, and I left. We started heading toward my daughter's. My girlfriend was driving and I got the device out to charge it. That was when the sun hit the top of the box and I saw that my name was pressed into the top. Someone had signed my name on a piece of paper on top of the box and the indentation was still there. I'm looking at it now and it is clearly my first and last name. 
I have absolutely no explanation for how my name happened to be on the box. There's no reason for it to be there, and it's very concerning. So that's it. I don't want to post a pic because it's my full name, but I would be happy to send a pic to Mod as proof. Edit. I got a pic. It's just the first letter. I covered the rest for my privacy. Flash of Light by U Slash Iris Went. This was about three to four years ago when I was in my second year of high school. I've left school now, but forgot about this incident until now. We were in a religious studies classroom, just learning about stuff while the teacher is talking. I'm paying attention to what the teacher is saying until a huge flash of white light happened outside. I looked outside and then looked back around the classroom, and nobody else seemed to have noticed it. My childhood best friend was a table over, and she was looking at me confused. I asked her if she has seen it. She said yes. We were the only people that witnessed it. It didn't even feel like a flash of light. It felt like everything outside of the classroom itself just disappeared into a white void for about one and a half seconds. It didn't corrupt my vision at all, so this is where I find it hard to believe that it was a flash of light, because I genuinely looked out of the window and it was just like a white void. I brought this up to her a couple of months back and she still remembers it and thinks the same thing as me. She also doubts it was a flash of random light as it looked like a void. I know, it's so difficult to try and explain to anyone because you wouldn't understand until you actually saw what we saw. And I still think it was some kind of glitch, like the world just didn't load in for a second. Ghost Car by U slash beep boop beep 411 My husband and I were driving home after a wedding two weeks ago. It was about a three hour drive home and it was close to 11 p.m. by the time that we left the wedding. So we were prepping for a long night drive. The road from the venue before we hit a major highway is about a 27-mile country road that is less traveled, especially during the night. Husband and I were both very aware of our surroundings, since lots of deers were coming out and we wanted to keep an eye out in case one decided to jump into the road. The road is pitch black and there are no other cars around us for a while. Then, we see headlights coming from the other direction, still pretty far away but making its way towards us. All of a sudden, the headlights disappear, and it's completely pitch black ahead of us again. My husband and I look at each other and both immediately think, Oh hell, we're about to get jumped! My brain immediately went to those stories about bad people pretending to be stuck on the side of the road and ask for help, only to hurt and steal the cars from their victims, or whatever. I start to panic and tell my husband to drive fast and don't stop, and husband starts talking more logically saying things like, Maybe they turned into a street, or maybe there's a hill, and they went down which is why we can't see them anymore. And I'm here saying, Nah, we would have seen the lights turn if they went into a street or driveway. But the hill explanation seemed possible. We keep driving and driving, looking out for any side streets or hill. But none. No streets or driveway to turn into and absolutely no hill. This road was as flat as my chest back in 6th grade. Literally, it was flat, and we kept looking for a car that may have been parked on the side of the road. But nothing. This road is small, 
only two lanes, and surrounded by fenced farmlands and trees. There's no way that we would have missed a car parked on the side of the road. And I'm not sure what happened to that car, but I get chills just thinking about it. Vehicles glitching, or am I losing it? By user Bonafide Bunny Eyed. I am aware of the you don't see the red car till you have one phenomenon, but that seems to occur when you're thinking about it. I don't actively think about cars disappearing and reappearing, but it has happened to me three times, so I wonder what gives. And no doubt y'all have no idea where these places are, so I'm not being intentionally vague, just trying to give a good idea of circumstance. The first time has been at least six months ago. I was traveling up the highway to a client's house. A very bright orange SUV was behind me, not close or tailgating, just in the rear. We approached the stop sign, dead end, to go left or right on the next highway, and we both headed left up an inclined, curvy, forested road to the next town. I saw a larger truck coming that I didn't want to lag behind. My car is old, I need a running start. So I got on out and out of the way. I kept an eye on my rear view mirror to make sure I hadn't cut him off and zipped on. As the road planed back out, I can see at least half a mile behind me now. No vehicle of any type. About a half mile further is my right turn onto the next highway. I just happened to look up in my rear view mirror when I made my turn, and that bright ass orange SUV is right behind me, as if it had dropped out of the sky. And I had been glancing back because I wondered why no cars had come around the big truck. There was no one back there. The second instance was last week. I was behind a porta potty truck and went around it. Of course, I was faster. My car is small and I'm not hauling anything. Several miles and four turns later to a four-way stop, there it is again, coming from the right at the stop sign and it gets in front of me again? Like it dropped from the sky. And I know it was the same one because there was a name sticker on the window and I felt the crapper wasn't properly secured. Which was why I hauled ass around as quickly as possible the first and second time. Anyway, I passed around it again and when I looked in the rearview mirror a few seconds later, the truck was gone. Nowhere to hang a quick turn or driveway to be in, just gone. Last experience was yesterday. We were coming up the highway and a small grey crossover was coming into the median to turn into traffic in our direction. They came up a big truck on the wrong side so I had a small concern they didn't see us and were poised to pull on out. I was watching intently at that spot to see the car stopped, I could see under the truck body, and not even the tires were visible, like it was never there. I kept looking back and nothing. Are cars glitching on the regular and I'm just noticing, or am I losing it? Has anyone else lost time while exercising? It happened to me near the beach in San Francisco, California. By you slash Moscow Ramada. I have been running for over two decades now, and because I've run so much, it may be the thing that I know best in life right now. I know how long my runs usually are, how fast I run, and all the other details. Normally, I run for one hour on the beach, on the ocean beach in San Francisco. That means a 30-minute run out and a 30-minute run back. Let's call those two legs. And normally, the difference between the legs is on the order of 1 to 2 minutes. Yesterday, I experienced something abnormally greater than that, which I still can't puzzle out. My run started very normally. I remember, on my way out of the door... I was looking at the stove clock and thinking that it's a little past 10, like 10 or 4 or something. I cross the street and there's kind of a big group of ravens on the ground. I plow through the middle of them. I wasn't trying to be rude or to antagonize them. The path to the beach went through their group. Maybe one of them moved away from me, hopped a few feet away, and was a little disruptive but not excessively so, and it felt like one of them glared at me, but I didn't make much of it. So I get to the beach, very close to where I live, 
It was windy and cold, and this will be relevant later. I decided to go right this time instead of my usual left, and I checked my watch and it says something 21. To explain the vagueness, I used to run with my phone, but it's damn heavy, and of course, a phone is precious and I don't want it getting water or sand in it. So, I got this cheap wristwatch on the internet, the cheapest possible wristwatch, which isn't even set to the accurate time. I just know that if I start at 6.21 on the watch, and I want to run for an hour as I did this time, I need to turn around at 6.51 to be back home at 7.21. Most days when I run, I finish within 2-3 to three minutes of that, and it varies a little. So, I do my usual run, nothing too noteworthy happens. At one point, I see a guy running his ATV on the sand, and I think he's not supposed to do that, that's the first time I'd seen him out, and I saw him in a construction vest and a helmet, and I thought that he worked for the city, but this time, I thought I think he's doing that on purpose, and he wants people to think that he's on official city business, when really, he just doesn't want to be identified because he's not supposed to use his ATV here on the sand. Then, shortly after seeing him, I see a kid standing on a small sand cliff yelling. He's just yelling at nothing, towards a spot that I passed through. At first I wondered if that was a mentally disturbed person that I've seen in the area, who I've also seen yelling around there, but seemed younger, like 10, and wearing a nice puffy jacket. I get close to the turnaround point and thought about checking my watch earlier, but I decided, no, I don't want to tease myself with being able to run around when it's not time. I'll check when it's closer to the time. So I check at what seems like the earliest possible turnaround point, and it's something 8. Huh? It should be somewhere around 51. I do the math. Around 17 minutes off. Did the watch malfunction? I'm not sure. How did this run take so long? I run back, and the kid is still yelling. He was yelling 15 minutes ago and now still yelling. ATV guy is still there and a little past him, and on my way back we seem to stay in each other's sight, as he is headed in my direction, goes past it, and then comes back. This time, I am much more focused at the end of my run on my watch, and it reads perfectly, exactly as expected when I finished, something around 38. It took 30 minutes. And we're back in the normal time now. My watch isn't malfunctioning anymore. If it ever was. And just to let you know, it wasn't. So I remember now, I have a second source of truth. I looked at the stove when I left and I checked it when I get back to my room. It says 11.23 or so. Weird. That matches up with what I would expect if the wristwatch time is accurate, so the run took 1 hour and 17 minutes. But how? I decided to check Google Maps for the first leg of the run and how long that would take at that speed. And according to Google Maps, it's 47 minutes is how long it would take to walk to the turnaround point. Which seems about right, if I'd actually walked, but first of all, I was running, I knew it, and secondly, even if I had been walking, I would have been frigid from the sea wind and getting continuous feedback from my body to run and warm the hell up because I was dressed in shorts and a t-shirt. I'm not so physically tough that I can walk in 60 degree weather into a stiff ocean breeze and not even notice. I'd notice every second and be uncomfortable with it. In fact, 
I went out today and tried walking in that outfit, and I was like, yeah, confirmed, this is very cold and very unpleasant, and I only walked for one to two minutes and noticed that I was cold and disliking it the whole time before turning back to my return place. One more thing as a runner. When you run in one direction, then come back the way you came and are faster on the way back, they call that negative splits. Normally it's like finishing two minutes faster. It's not easy. This time, in my negative splits, I finished almost 50% faster. Like two decades ago, I could occasionally pull off negative splits but never anything on this order. Even a measly 10% improvement would have been impressive. So this blows that away. And I'm decades older now too. So, I don't get it. It's like from one second to the next, I was catapulted 17 minutes into the future. There was no perceptible tell for me. It was a totally normal run, a totally normal experience, except I lost 17 minutes on it. I don't have any good explanation for all of this, but I'm sure my run was 17 minutes longer than usual, all on that one leg too. My take is I have no idea what happened. But I'm going to be more respectful around the ravens next time than I run across them. Next time, I'll take the long way around. Still, that's not an answer, and while I don't think I'll get one, I'd like to know if anyone else has experienced something similar. I think I skipped in time today. I use slash Vesdas 90. So this happened earlier today and I'm still trying to process it as it makes zero sense. A friend of mine and I traveled together between two towns earlier today. We agreed that he would pick me up at 8 p.m. We were both on time and he made a joke about on how we were both very punctual because that's not usually the case when we're meeting. We got in the car and he showed that his car had gas for exactly 681 kilometers more. A joke about our country being formed in year 681, which will be important later on. So we drove off pretty much immediately on what usually is a 1 hour and 45 minutes to a 2 hour drive journey. We were expecting to arrive at roughly 10 p.m. The journey itself was on a road that we've both traveled hundreds of times, so we know it very well. It's only 95 kilometers, but the road is through the mountain so you can't really drive fast, and that's why it usually takes at least 1 hour and 30 minutes at a very minimum. There wasn't a lot of traffic in our direction, so we had a relaxed time chatting and driving. Also, my friend is usually a pretty slow driver, and his car isn't all that powerful. He was pretty much driving how he always does, and there wasn't a single time that I thought he was speeding or anything, and his driving was never brought into the conversation because of how routinely everything felt. Nothing really special happened during the drive, up until we arrived at the destination town, and my friend said that it felt like that was the quickest journey that he's had on that road ever in his life. I felt the same way, and so we checked the clock and it was showing 20.45. Only 45 minutes had passed somehow. We were both really baffled because that's just not possible. I've been in cars speeding like hell on that road, and they never even come close to a time like that, let alone with my friend's slow driving. What also adds to the mystery 
is now his car is showing that it has enough gas to go for another 652 kilometers, like we've only traveled for 30 kilometers. I know, it's a moving metric based on how you drive, but this isn't making any sense considering how consistent he is in his driving style. He also called his grandmother to tell her that we have arrived, who he just seen before we left. And she thought that he was lying to her because only 45 minutes had passed and we couldn't have possibly arrived yet. And I'm still not sure what to do after these bizarre events. It's Gone by you slash fond of pink. I have a flight next morning, so I wanted to sleep early, but I'm so upset, so I started to read the experiences here and share my own. Right after I was done with packing, I remember that I did not put my face cleanser in, so I went to my room to get it which was new and never been used because I was still using the little tester bottle which I got before buying the product itself. So, the tester bottle was in the bathroom and the big bottle was in my room. But now, it wasn't. It should have been on my makeup desk, but it wasn't there, so I searched my whole room. Then I thought perhaps I actually packed it, I removed every item in my bag, but nothing. Then I searched the whole house. I searched the whole house for an item that was literally on my makeup desk. Cleanser might sound like something that can go missing easy, but the thing is, this one was special because I finally found one that my skin likes. No irritation, no allergic reaction. It cleared my face so well after a couple of usage of the tester bottle. So when I bought the product itself, expensive, but I was so happy with it. So I put it on my desk to make sure that I'm packing it with me. And it was a huge bottle. Nothing makes sense right now. I know it was there. And then it wasn't? But I guess sometimes that's what happens, huh? Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.